All right, so we're recording. Okay, guys, <clears throat> welcome to the NDEB orientation and specifically AFK orientation. I just want to confirm everybody's okay. If everyone is having any connection problems, Dr. Haj, I could help you through the chat. Um, and we're going to start. So my name is Dr. Ahmed Hafez. Um, that's teaching here at Scholars Dental. Scholars Dental is the institute, the educational institute that's trying to help people or foreign trained dentists get through their exams, specifically specialized in AFK, so theory stuff. And we also have an ACJ course, so both AFK and ACJ. Everybody still sees the screen, right? So I'm going to, that's me, just to kind of have an idea if you've seen me before who, who's talking to you. Um, teaching at the at our, our institute here, giving the classes. So my name is Dr. Ahmed Hafez, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself so that you know who's your instructor. And just some things. What what are we going to talk about today? Okay, so I have a little summary for you, just to kind of, we have something for everyone. Okay, what's this here? I'm going to move that. So we have something for everyone. Some of you are late in the process. You already know everything. You just want to know more about AFK. Some of you are new that don't know a lot about the NDEB process itself. So we're going to talk about the NDEB process. And then if you are, if you're a beginner, you're, you're gonna to wanna to know a little bit about applying and the NDEB process, right? And then um, if you are someone interested for in-class course, we're gonna talk about that, we're gonna address that. And all, especially if you want the online course, sorry, I spelled that wrong, online, you're going to, we're gonna talk about that as well. I'm gonna demonstrate how you will see it and how it looks like. Okay, so basically we're going to go through how to become a dentist and applying to the NDEB, okay, for people that want to know more about the NDEB process, about our AFK course, about the AFK exam, how to study, how to prepare, and what to expect. And then we're going to demonstrate our new online course, which is going to be really awesome. We're going to have a surprise demonstration, and we're going to give you the access to our epidemiology page, okay? So that's the stuff we're going to do today. So let's begin with and this is actually one of the first true i think pretty much um a true afk online course um does sorry i just want to confirm can everybody hear me if you could hear me just type in yep we could hear you i just want to make sure my sound is working <clears throat> okay so uh, everyone is thank you okay so i think one person is having an issue with the their, um, headphone issues. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, so the true AFK, this is a true AFK online course. We worked really hard during last course to record the sessions, to edit them, and, and, and even like the recording is moving with me so that you can see what I'm drawing on the board and, and you can see the slides and you're gonna be shipped the books. This is a true AFK online course. Okay, it's not something where you kind of see, um, you know, it's not like a, a course where it's a live session on Facebook or it's not a course where you have to actually leave your house to go to a certain center and then watch it broadcasted. This is a true course that you will receive to your to your home online on our website and you could watch it and you could rewind and you have flexibility. OK, so we're going to talk about that at the end. I'm going to show you how to do it. And it's very important if you're considering the online course to stay until the end so that you see how it works because there's some ways, like I wanna show you how you are going to um, navigate the website as a student, okay? Great, so let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about the license. I wanna put these chat boxes to the side here for a bit, okay? Just so that I have more room. So how to become a licensed dentist? How do you become a licensed dentist here? Well, what you want to do is to become a licensed dentist is you have to apply to what we call is the Provincial Dental Regulatory Authority. Right? It's a funny name, but that's who's there's actually uh, interestingly, there's a release question about this. So you have to know the people that are that are responsible for licensed dentist is this. Not the NDEB by the way. The NDEB is responsible for examinations, not for license. Okay? So this is you, you know, and you're, you're happy because you have a, a great opportunity to become a dentist, okay, here, and you found out. So what you have to do is you have to apply to 
this regulatory authority. And, and in Ontario, it's called RCDSO, for example. Now, the RCSO requires something from you. It requires a few things, including the NDEB certificate. And this NDEB certificate proves that you passed your examinations and you're and you're um, you know your stuff for dental, right? So that's the NDEB is responsible for checking your knowledge. The RCSO is responsible for checking your practice and making sure you're licensed, you're a proper licensed dentist. So now you have to go to the NDEB. So these are two different organizations. The NDEB is only responsible for examining you and approving you and giving you the NDEB cert. Once you get that, you could take that and give it to the RCDSO, then you could become a dentist. Okay, so let's look at that a little bit more. So you're going to ask this regulatory authority, can I work as a dentist? They're going to say, well, we want some papers. First of all, give us a certificate that you completed the NDEB process, that you are, you completed all your exams. Okay. <clears throat> and they will ask some of you for an English test, so TOEFL or IELTS. And obviously, we're going to have you're going to have to send them again university papers. So the same way you send some papers to the NDEB, you're going to need to send papers again to the RCSO or the regulatory authority. Don't think that the NDEB is just like and and an, the NDEB and the RCSO for example, in Ontario, they're not one, okay? They don't, the NDEB is not going to send your university papers to the RCSO. You're going to have to send your papers to NDEB, then your papers to RCSO later on, okay? So keep that in mind if you want to make more copies. Okay, so now we know that you need this NDEB certificate. Who's going to give you that? The NDEB. This is what it looks like. This is what you're working for from the NDEB, okay? And, and now you're all going to, you know, um, you're all thriving and struggling and, and working hard to get your name here and your university is going to be here and this is your NDEB certificate. Okay. So once you get your NDEB certificate, you could apply to the Provincial Dental Regulatory Authority. So for example, in Ontario, if you are in Ontario, you're going to apply to the Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario. It's called the RCDSO. If you live in British Columbia, yours is called College of Dental Surgeons of British Columbia. So that could be CDSBC. If you're in Alberta, it's ADAC. So everybody, ha every province every has its own regulatory authority. However, the NDEB is national. So the NDEB is for the whole country. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> so I hope that's kind of clear so far. Um, now. So we said, what does the RCDSO want? It wants the NDEB cert, the English test, and the university paper. So how do you get the NDEB certificate? Okay, well, first you have to pass. All you do, all you really need to do to get the NDEB certificate, really, um, yeah, so someone's sound is not working. Try to play with your sound options so that you could connect it to the app, maybe. Try using Chrome um, browser instead. Um, try to adjust your sound in Windows so that it's 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 going through that specific one. There's many things. Everyone else is hearing, so it's, it's not from our end for sure. Um, so try to see if you could fix that. Sorry to hear that. Um, so again, how to get the NDEB certificate. So you have to pass the written board, pass the written board, and the OSCE exam. Okay, that's how you. That's all you really need to do, to be honest. You have. This is what it is. You have to pass the written board exam, which is a multiple choice question, and pass the OSCE exam, which is which are cases that you'll have to solve. But the issue is the NDEB is not just going to let anyone go ahead and take these two exams. You have to have qualifications. Okay, so. The NDB is not just going to let anyone take the OSCE and written board and board exam, right? Because if you do that, you're going to get the certificate. So not everyone is allowed to do it. Who can take these exams? Who can take the OSCE and board exams? Well, here. People that are from accredited dental program. 
And that means graduates of Canadian dental school, American dental school, Australian, New Zealand, and Ireland. All these could take the OSCE and board exams. Okay? So all these people could take the OSCE and board exam, and then they could get their CERT, the NDEB CERT. Well, what if you are non-accredited, like most of us, you're not from one of these universities, then they, then they made the path a little bit longer for you. First, I want to show you how, to, how the people here become a dentist, so you understand the pathway and you appreciate it, okay? Um, let's see. So, someone here wants to become a dentist in Canada. They study high school and then they apply to a university and that's called undergrad, okay? So, they're an undergrad. Let's say usually people that want to do dental school or medicine, they go into sciences. And during those four years, they have to get high GPAs. GPA is the average out of four. So they might get like a 3.8 out of four or something like that, right? That's their average over the, all the four years for every test. So they have to keep getting high marks every single test for the four years. And if they screw up a few times, that's it. Their average is dead. They won't be able to get into dental school or medicine. That's how hard it is. Now, don't forget, they're also paying for this expensive university. So they're probably already in debt. Let's say, I don't know how much a year. Let's say, I think at least 10000 a year for undergrad. So they're probably in debt 50000 now. Right? And then they go to dental school. And first, they have to get applied. They have to get accepted, right? It's very competitive. So once you get accepted, now you're in dental school, you're doing four years, and now it's probably going to cost you, who knows, 40000 a year. So that's like maybe another um, 160k, right? So out of this all, you're like $200,000 in debt, and, and I know some people are 300 actually, okay? And then you pass, and then once you finish all of this, so how long, how long is that? Almost eight years of studying. $300,000 of debt, and finally, finally, they are allowed now to take the written board exam and OSCE, and then after that, from the written board, they could get their NDEB certificate. You see how hard they have to work to get this cert? Okay. <clears throat> so that's how hard they had to work. And you have to understand the psychology of this. They struggled. The people here really struggle hard to get to that level. And, and what happens when you do that is they appreciate being a general dentist. Okay, they appreciate that. They feel like finally they have overcome all these obstacles and they finally reached their goal of being a general dentist. And that's a big deal here. It's not like a general dentist is a respected profession and in the very, um, there's good income for it. So it's hard work. It's a lot of work for people that do dentistry here. You don't see you don't see people here always wanting to specialize. Now, if you look at back home, you know if you look at back home, you find people that are always like they just want to specialize. That's it. Like that's that's their everybody wants to specialize here in Canada. It's not that way because being a GP is like is like being a specialist. Why? Because you studied. Eight years, you already feel like you are a specialist. You feel like you work so hard. So not everybody wants to specialize. The people that want to specialize, only people that really like that part of dentistry, right? This is why the mentalities from back home is like where everybody wants to specialize because they think that's the highest thing. People here feel dentistry itself is the specialty. And now if you want to go extra, fine. But they're already in debt, so they really appreciate being this, right? They really appreciate being the GP. Because a lot of people from back home are already specialists. They don't feel, they're like, well, I'm a specialist. Why should I be a GP here? The GP here is a big deal, right? And, and, and you're actually getting a good deal because you're working less than what the doctor, dentist needed to work here to get, become a dentist. Okay. So let's compare your paths. Okay. So that's for people studying here. Your pathway as a non accredited person, you all have to do is take the AFK exam. Okay. Yeah, you might need to pay a few a few thousand for a course in the exam. Okay, you're done. Let's say I'll cost you five thousand. Okay, five thousand. And then after you pass your AFK, you have two routes. Okay. 
you either go and, and, and go through university or you take more exams. There's two paths for people, for train, foreign trained dentists to become dentists here in Canada, two ways, okay? It all starts with um, becoming, all starts with the AFK uh, exam. Okay, so all starts with the AFK exam. Okay, I feel bad for a person that can't hear, but uh, we have to move on. That's why I ask people to come in early to make sure all these problems are fixed. Okay, so you do the AFK exam, okay? And then after that, you have two paths. I think you all know this. You either do the direct, which is you do the skills and judgment, and these could be done, um, you know, you could do the judgment first, you could do the skills first, you could, it doesn't matter which one you do first, or you just go to university, okay? And then once you're done these two things, you'll all end up in the same place doing the written board and OSCE exam and you get your cert. Now, what's the difference? Why would somebody want to go to university? Well, first of all, going to university requires you to get a high mark in AFK. Maybe 90, maybe 91, maybe 88. High marks in AFK to get accepted to university. So here's the difference. If you're doing the university path, Think this, you're going to probably need two to three years to finish this, and it's going to cost you over 100000 and maybe even between 100 and 200. So just getting into the IDAP program, for example, in U of T costs 50K, and then you have to do the third year, which may cost maybe 40K, and then fourth year, which may cost another 40K. So you're thinking over 100000 and two to three years. So you're in debt. Going through the the... The other way, which is you do skills and judgment, think that is going to cost you between thirty and fifty thousand, and it's going to take you one to two years. Honestly, this is nothing compared to what people here need to go through. Remember this, right? And this is something I really want you guys to pay attention to. Us, I'll be honest, foreign trained dentists, they like to complain about the NDEB, right? They complain about the NDEB. And they're always saying, oh, the NDB is not being fair. The NDB is giving you a good advantage. Actually, if you hear the stories of general dentists that studied here, they're upset that you, we're getting this advantage. They're thinking, why is it that they only have to pay thirty to 50000 and become dentists here just like us, where we have to pay three hundred, two hundred thousand, 200000 go through eight years of studying? This is not fair. So take, take, this, take um, advantage of this situation, right? And don't complain about it. In that way you should be kind of happy about it um, yes they're not gonna make it easy for you they're not gonna allow people to come into the country and become dentists all of a sudden right like you have to work for being a dentist like you have to work hard and this is something that I, I noticed from students the students that are willing to put the effort in are the students that will pass okay so you can see here now look compare the two to two sides people that do dentistry here four years of undergrad accredited four years and then they could do these board exams you already did it in your in your country right maybe it took you four to five years and then you come here and you have to go through these exams and you could be the same dentist the same general dentist as this person but you paid less you see so it's it's a good deal this is there's two things i want to talk about here i'll talk about the obstacles okay so yeah that's the thing you know i see people that don't appreciate this opportunity they think it's an unfair opportunity it's it, the questions are too hard no that's that's not real if the questions are hard they're hard for everyone so it's a fair game right but it's a good opportunity and the people that are willing to work for it are the people that will pass where did i talk about the acj stuff okay so here's the strategy, okay? I'm gonna show you. This is a timeline. I'm just putting this strategy to think what you can do. You have to think about your, what you can do, right? In terms of time and money. So everybody has to start with the AFK. Actually, right? Everybody has to start with the AFK. So let's say here's a timeline 
And let's say this is um, the August. This is a Feb exam. And there's another one in August, right? So that's the August. There's another AFK here. And somewhere here, there's an ACJ and ACS. Somewhere here, there's an ACJ and ACS. And this is what I recommend to all my students, okay? So I'm going to give you a good strategy here that I recommend to you guys. So the AFK, okay, it costs maybe four to, let's say, 5000 to finish this process with courses and applying to the exam and all that stuff. And again, if you're not willing to go through this right here, then how are you even ready for the skills, which is going to cost you 20 to 30? Like, you have to be prepared for that, right? This is the cost of your investment. You want to invest in yourself or not. But this is the concept. You do the AFK, and the thing is, the results don't come out until somewhere here, let's say late March. So you don't really have a lot of time to prepare for the ACS and ACJ together. So what you're doing is, if you try to do the AFK and then try to pass the ACJ and ACS, you may fail both. So what I recommend is you do the AFK, and then you do the ACJ only, and then you pass that, you finish all the theory, and then you do the ACS here. Okay? This way you minimize risk of failing. And this will save you money. It will probably take more time, but it's probably saving you time on the long run. Okay? Is that clear? Okay? So my recommendation is you do AFK. Okay? You do AFK. Then you do ACJ, and then worry about ACS, because ACS is a whole different game, right? You need all these expensive equipment, you need to practice for a while, you don't know how much time you need. So that's that's the, the, what I advise my students. Now, if you ask me what I did, I actually took all of it together, I but I had a lot of time, and I barely passed the ACS because I was doing everything together. I got a high mark in the AFK, thankfully, and I passed the ACJ, but I wanted to do it all together, and I and I got through. But I right now it's very competitive. It's different times, and and the price is different. So imagine you try to do the AFK. Let's draw that again. You finished AFK, and now you want to do ACJ and ACS at the same time, and you only have two months to prepare. The ACS exam is just the exam is nine nine thousand now. And a course is probably going to be around 6,000. And the materials will only probably be 20, 10 to 20,000. But imagine this here that you wasted that and you because you failed. And imagine you try to do the ACJ, maybe 2,000. The course is maybe 2,000. And imagine you failed both. Isn't that a big loss of money? So no, just do the AFK. Focus on the ACJ. Get that done. Don't do the ACS. And then do the ACS in the term after. Okay. That will give you more time to train for the ACS and minimize your loss. Now, if you have money laying around and you just want to do everything and take the risk, that's fine. Go ahead. But just I don't think people just have money laying around usually because I didn't at that time. Okay. Is that clear for everyone? So let's go back to the chart here and talk about what kind of mindset you have to have for this. Now, I could tell you stories about people, but... I'm going to show you, you're going to have obstacles, okay? You, look, you, okay? There will be obstacles for sure. Everybody has obstacles, okay? There will be obstacles in your way. And your job is to overcome these obstacles, one after another. It's not my job to overcome them for you. What I could help you with is knowledge and educate you. I'm going to help you with the AFK exam, with teaching. But everybody's going to have obstacles. Okay. Um, if you have an NDEB cert, sorry, no, it doesn't work for the U.S. So let me go back, actually, and I'll, I'll discuss that with you guys. Okay. But um, I want to talk about here. Now, some people, when there's an obstacle in their way, they start going, life is too hard. I can't do this exam. I can't make it. They start wanting us, like the, the institute, to kind of 
somehow eliminate their obstacles. We can't do that for you. You're going to have, everybody's going to have different obstacles. Someone's going to have an obstacle with distance. Someone's not going to have a car. Someone doesn't have money. Someone can't leave the house because of kids. Everybody has different obstacles, right? And it's your job. The people that overcome these obstacles are the people that deserve to pass this exam because they are willing to put the effort. They're willing to figure out ways to solve these problems. Okay. And there's always a way. I had a student last time. Um, that was coming through bus from, you know, two hours away. I had students that drove three from three to four hours every weekend. These people are willing to overcome these obstacles. They're like, you know what? This is an obstacle and I'm willing to put the effort. I myself had to walk and in, in take buses in snow with my NDEB kits to get to certain places to practice. You know, I lived, like personally, I lived on, well, I lived on $200 a month just to kind of get by and, and take loans from other people so I could get by these exams. Everybody had obstacles, so you have to figure out your obstacles um, and, and solve them, okay? Now, here's a good point. Why would someone want to do the university path? Well, there's two advantages for a university path. One is you are more likely to get to a specialty if you want to apply, even though it's still hard. And if you have a degree, you have from from a Canadian university. So a degree from Canadian uni, this will allow you to work or or work in US A because all you have to do is their OSCEs. However, if you do the MDEB path, I mean the direct path, you can't really go and work in the US. You have to start over. Okay. Is that clear for everyone? So, so why you might ask, why would someone want to go this pathway if it's this difficult and it costs a lot more money, the university pathway? Well, th there's one advantage for it. The advantage for the university is that um, you get a degree, a DDS degree from Canada, and this allows makes it easier for you in the USA and, and also um, easier for specialty. That's it. But if you just want to be a general dentist and you're happy to work and make money and just, you know, and, and you know, I'll be honest, you don't really need to be a specialist here. As a GP, you're, you're almost allowed to do anything. So you could do impacted wisdom teeth. So as a general dentist, you could do ortho, perio, prosto. What do you want? Implants, anything, anything you want, really. Just the things you can't do is very complicated stuff. Like don't do tumor removals in your office and you're good. Okay, like just don't do certain highly specialized things. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to make a pause and see is, is everything clear about the, those kind of things I'm talking about for everyone? Why you would do the degree that the NDB cert is not, um, is not good for if you want to go abroad, if you want to go out of, out, out of Canada, then you have to do the university. Okay. Okay, it's good to get feedback because sometimes, you know, when I'm not in class, I have no idea what you guys are doing or thinking. It's different. I don't see any faces, right? So <laughs> I just need to know if you guys are still with me here. Okay, because I feel like sometimes online, it's like you're talking to the computer. Um, but anyway, what kind of obstacles have I seen? I'll tell you from my experience, okay? And I, I'm going to be real with you guys. I'm not here to, you know, make sure things for you. I want you to, to kind of like see reality, okay? Everyone has obstacles. You're not the only one. Because I always get people, we'll talk about that, Jessica, um, later uh, uh, to see what the details about that is, okay? Um, but everybody's going to have obstacles. And people come to me thinking that they're the only ones that have obstacles. Everybody... Look, everybody has a money issue because everybody came from abroad and the conversion rate is is tough, right? So you you're going to you're going to feel like you don't have enough um and the courses are expensive. Um knowledge, everybody may have a problem with that too. Time, distance, everybody's going to have some one of these problems or more, okay? This is normal. You're not the only one. I had it, I figured it out. Everybody in my class has it and they figured it out. So <clears throat> Um, guys, we'll do a question session in, in between. Okay, well, I guess I could do that now here.
So how difficult is it to get into university? It's pretty competitive. You have to get a high mark. Um, you have to get a high mark in AFK. And you have to, each university has different things. So for example, if you want to go to UFT, UFT does an interview, which is actually difficult. It's not just like a, a baby interview. And you have to get high in AFK. You have to have a certain score from your school. And you have to pass a psychology test. So these are some things, okay? Um, let's say in Western University, in Western University, you have to do an actual skills exam. So every university has different things, and we could talk about that in more detail. I'm more concerned about the direct path, but I want you guys to look at these obstacles. First of all, knowledge, okay? Yes, knowledge could be an obstacle. This is why it's something in your way and and to minimize this to instead of you working on your own trying to find all the questions and answers and what material to study that's why there's courses okay so don't risk it it's easier if you take a course you may think hey i don't want to pay you know four thousand but honestly it's nothing compared to what you're getting i'll be honest with you if i if i if i go take a course right now in dentistry i pay 500 a day that's how much dental courses are worth. So if you're getting, if you're paying four thousand for like a thirty-four day course, that's nothing really. Like if you do the division, it's not a lot. Okay, but anyway, you have to be willing to invest. If you're finding that this is something difficult, then you're not willing to invest in yourself. You're not willing to sacrifice for this thing, for this whole process. Um, you know, because the skills is going to cost you around twenty, thirty thousand. Okay, so that's. But we're here to give you the knowledge, and I could assure you that the, what we teach you is going to be enough and beyond, okay, 100%. Now, that's what we're going to take care of. Scholars Dental, we're going to take care of your knowledge. Now, people are going to have obstacles in money, okay? So that's something you have to manage yourself. You have to figure out, okay, maybe you need to get loans, right? Maybe you have to um, save up, right? Figure, figure things out that that you have enough money. I told you how much the whole process may cost you. It may cost anywhere from 30 to 50,000. So I'm giving you already that info. Now, you could work. So if you work, you're going to have less time. So you have to figure that out too. So time could be an issue, right? People that have kids are not like people that are single, right? They're different time. People that are working are don't are don't don't have the same time like people that are not working. So that's also an obstacle. Do you have time? And you have to be realistic. So if you're someone that has a family and you're working and you're taking care of them, maybe you need a year to prepare for the AFK. Just be realistic with yourself. Maybe you need more time. Maybe you don't have that time to study. If you're, you know, if you're married but you don't have kids and you're not working, then you have time to prepare. Maybe you need a different, you have a different pace of learning. So everybody's different, but, but it, is, it is an obstacle. Distance is usually an obstacle because I had so many people from last year that said, hey, you know, like we come from this city and to drive to you to Mississauga is around two to three hours. Can we get a discount? And I said, wait, what, what, what's, what's that got to do with us? Like if you, you have to, I'm, I'm making it to the class every day. You have to make it to class every day. That's your effort. That's your obstacle. Overcome it. Or you don't really deserve to do this. You have to show the effort. Um, I know a dentist here that had to go to Alberta to, to study dentistry. So all that is like you have to overcome it. Now, we do have we have fixed these problems, right? I fixed the distance problem with the online course. And we're going to talk about it. The time problem, you're going to see that there's flexibility with the online course as well. So hopefully those two problems are solved for you. We all have different obstacles. Everyone will certainly have obstacles. In order to pass, you must put the effort to overcome these obstacles. You must overcome them, and it won't be easy. I'm sorry. If you're thinking it's going to be an easy, easy thing, we will make it easier for sure, but it's not going to be easy. Okay. And we're, we have a surprise. I'm going to show you the online course later. So what did we just to conclude here? There's two paths to get, there's two paths, okay? Um, you have the direct, right, without university, and you have the university path. We talk about the money and time that costs. But they all start and end the same way. The start is always apply to NDEB and do the AFK. 
right? And the end is going to do the ASCII. And they only defer in the middle here. If you want, if you decide you want to do the direct, then you have to do the skills and judgment. If you decide to go to university, you have to learn how to apply, do interview, finish university. However, everything you want, if you want to become a dentist in Canada, you have to start with getting to the NDEB and getting the AFK exam, and you have to end with the OSCE. This is why the most important thing is AFK to me, because that's the that's where you have all we all have to start. Okay, so now, are you guys clear for about this? So, let's talk about the direct path, okay? Because I know most of you are concerned about direct path this way. And if anybody has any ideas, like any questions about the university path, I could answer that at the end. Okay, so the direct path. First, you have to apply to the NDEB and get approved. Then, you have to do the AFK exam pass the AFK exam, and then you could do the skills exam and judgment together, or you could choose which one to do first. And then once you're done that, you become, when you pass these, you become accredited. They consider you an accredited person, and then you could take the OSCE and written board exams. Okay, let's talk about NDEB application. I'll go over it quickly. So first, you're gonna make an account about your information, and you're going to have to send them a notarized photo ID. Um, also, also, just double check if there's any new info. This is updated based on what I've seen newly, that now they want the original degree and translations of the dental degree. They want your transcripts, so your marks from the translation copy. And also, they want transcripts, meaning your marks, from the university seal. So from the uni to NDEB directly. And then they also want a confirmation degree sealed from the university. Okay. Is that clear? So let's see. Pretty much they used to say they wanted only an authorized copy of the translation. Uh, sorry, an authorized copy of the degree, but now they want the original degree. That's what people are telling me. And then you want also a copy of the degree and a translation. So that's how the translation works. Okay. So first, your 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 degree, you have to send apparently the original copy. And when they say translation, it doesn't mean just like a paper translated. You have to send a photo, a notarized, sorry, a copy of the degree stapled to the translation by a sworn translator. Does that make sense? So. You'll have basically this. You'll have an original degree or a notarized copy of what I sent, but they're saying now they want original. And you'll have another document that's the copy of the degree stapled to the translation of it. So what the NDEB does is going to see, okay, this translation is a translation of this document, the copy of the degree. And then they're going to check this document is kind of comparable or equal or looks like a f the same as this document, and this is an original copy, okay? So that's what that is. So that's pretty much that's what you gotta do. Let's talk about the confirmation degree, which is one of the annoying parts of this whole process, and a lot of mistakes happen here. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is because our universities don't have the best communication back home, right? So the confirmation degree is a paper that has two parts. Let's say part A and part B. If the degree is in English, then no translation. Well, I guess so, yeah. So <laughs> I guess there's no translation of the degrees in English, okay? Um, so now this is the confirmation degree. You're going to fill up the first half. So you're going to put info here. You will fill up this half. And then you have to put this inside an envelope and send it to your university. Or maybe scan it and send it to your university. And then your university has to fill up the second half. So your university has to fill up the second half. You fill up the first half. And then the university has to put it inside an envelope sealed and send it to the NDEB. That's what the confirmation degree is. 
Now, unfortunately, our universities don't do this stuff sometimes. Some universities do, but some universities are don't even care. And a lot of times, the university itself may fill up here at a certain date that doesn't match your actual degree because I don't know what they're doing. So, and then the NDEB doesn't approve it. So this may happen, okay? You could find ways to kind of overcome it, ask your friends to help you out, to go to university, tell them what they need to fill out in the second form or in the second half, um, and have them send it from the university or the university send it with their address on it. So the university will have its address here that it's coming from them to the NDEB, right? That's what you need. Okay, so that's confirmation degree. So basically you make an account, it may cost you this much to make an account. I'm not sure how it is now, but that's how much you did. Dental degree, right? I used to do a notarized copy, but now they're saying they want original. So just send out the original and a translation. The transcripts, translation, the transcripts from the university and a confirmation degree, that's what you need to apply. And then you wait for your approval and you can't really do any exams unless you're approved. And there's other things. I heard there's something called the alternative application. Sometimes you could have a lawyer make an affidavit, which is you swear that you, for example, graduated. And some sometimes the NDB accepts this, so you could call them and see um, if they need it, if they could help you with that. All right. So I'm going to stop here before I get into the AFK, and I'm just going to check if anybody here has any questions so far. Okay. So we're going to take a little question. All right, so it's actually 12.50 now. They raise it up every every year, I guess. Okay, so I'm gonna accept questions about so we took so far. Before I get into the AFK and, and all the other stuff, I'm gonna, if anyone has any questions about the NDEB process itself, about the path between university direct path, all that stuff. You could type in the question, I'll start answering. Okay, I'm going to give maybe a few minutes. Okay, I don't see any questions. So everybody's okay so far? You want me to move on with AK? Okay, how, so Swetha is asking, how much time gap for approval after applying? Oof, I've seen a big range. I've heard people say, 15 weeks to be honest i don't know everybody's different sometimes um they say things i mean they say a certain time but sometimes it could take longer so it's a hard question to tell you for sure okay so ala has a question are the two ways similar to work in canada okay so whoa okay i'm getting all these questions now let me just <laughs> I'll start one by one. Um, so, are the two ways similar to work in Canada? To be honest, they are. Like once, if you do the direct path or you do the university path, the outcome is you are a general dentist and you are allowed to work as any general dentist. It's the same thing. Now, if there's any kind of discrimination, that's something you can't control. Like maybe someone wants someone from UFT, maybe someone doesn't. So it just depends, right? But work-wise, there's no difference. Um, so whether you do the NDEB direct path or uni, you both become GPs with the same abilities. You could do courses, you could become IV sedation, you could do whatever you want. Um, just if you do the uni, you'll probably have more connections Right, like you'll have friends that did dentistry here, and but also the NDAB direct, you also have friends from the from the process, right? Like we have, when you come to classes, is another thing that you'll you have a community to work with. You have friends, right? You, you make friends, and it feels better to study with people and 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 um, going through the process with people instead of doing it on your own because you see what others are doing. Um, Okay, so now that's that question. So it's work-wise the same, but the university may give you some connections and also specialty um, advantage, maybe if you want to specialize. Okay, now the next question is, um, 
the original copy should be sent by university. Yes, so the original copy should be sent by the university, but as uh, Dr. Hajar is saying, there's a ways around that, okay? Okay, hi doc, how long does the NDB certification process take routinely? Well, if you're going through a direct path, as I said, it may take one to two years, and if you're going through uni, it will take three to four, and this depends on if you're passing, right? So if, you, if someone unfortunately is failing, then you're, it's going to take longer. Okay. Now let's see what the next question is. All right, guys, I can't see the questions. You texting here. Okay. So I'm trying to see questions, but it's good. So I want to go to university. Oh, geez. Okay. It's getting complicated, guys. Just, uh, okay, everybody stop um, chatting for a bit so I could get through the questions because it keeps taking me to the, to the last comment, okay? Okay, let me start. Jessica, I want to go to university but failed once in Bachelor of Dentistry in India. Will I get admission after AFK? Um, I don't know what you mean by failed once, like in a one subject. Um, it doesn't matter. You All you need is, did you pass your university and do you have a good GPA? So the university, for example, of Toronto, you, it has like a kind of a... Uh, it has like a measuring tool that if you're from this university, let's say from Damascus University, your mark, let's say a 78 there, is equivalent to what? Is it, a, you know, so they have measuring tools to see what your your mark really is, like a conversion kind of tool, right? So you have to check that. It doesn't, I don't know what you mean by failed once, right? But I think you mean like maybe in a subject, that's fine. As long as you passed it later on and you got a mark in it, right? Unless that mark is zero now. Um, which path you took? Someone's asking me which path I took. Well, actually, I'll tell you what I did. I did the NDEB, so this will answer two questions, actually. When someone is asking how fast can you do it, I think I did it the fastest way possible. And um, and what I did is I did everything. So I did the AFK exam, and then I passed, and I did the ACS and ACJ. But I had, what I had is I had good, I had time. That was my advantage. I didn't have money, so I took loans, but I had time. I didn't need to work, so I took loans. And I did all the work I can in here, and I passed all, everything within those months. And then I did my OSCEs in this area, and then I was able to do it within a year. That's for, for me. Now, what path I took? I said I did the direct path. But I also, because I got 91 in my AFK, I also applied to uni, and I got accepted by University of Toronto. So I got accepted by U of T, and I also passed my exams and I had to make a decision. Do I want to continue just getting my license or do I want to go back to uni? And it was a hard decision at that point, but I decided that I want to go through the rec path and I just want to work and get the experience. And and going back to university is just going to kind of um, take more time and money from me. Like I'll be in debt now. So I'm happy that I took the direct path over that. Okay, so that's that question. Okay, so I answered the, the shortest time, I think, is doing it like that and within a year. Um, Dr. Daly, hi, NDB have to send the original degree back once documents are assessed. I'm not sure about that, to be honest. Do they? Yes. They'll, they say they send them back within six weeks. That's only for your diploma. Okay, Dr. Hajar, thank you. So that, that solves that. Okay, so we're, uh, are we all up, up to, I'm caught up on the questions. Is there any other questions? You guys could continue. For direct path, how much score do we need? It doesn't matter. So for the direct path, you don't have to have a high score. You just need to pass, which is 75%. And I'm going to talk about that in the AFK part. Venus, 
Um, how to overcome fear of failing. I'm going to talk about that. No problem. I'm going to get to that. The GPA depends on you, Swetha. Um, the GPA depends on your university. So the GPA, for example, in, I don't know, in uh, an Egyptian university is not the same as, so a 72, let's say, in this, in a university in Syria is not the same as 72 in a university of Egypt, for example. Like I'm saying an example. So there's a conversion tool on their website. I remember I, I stumbled upon and I, and I was able to put each university and how much that converts to. Okay. Okay, guys, are you all caught up? Is there? Yeah, but they want the original degree. I mean, back in my days, I sent in a notarized copy, but I don't know now. I'm hearing everybody saying that they want the original, and that's what they want. So then, what can you do? If, you're, if this is your goal, then you have to do it, right? Okay, guys. If you're done with the questions about the process itself in general, we're going to get into deep things about the AFK. Is everybody ready? Or does anyone have anything from behind or from before that wants to ask about? If it's anything specific about the AFK, leave it for the AFK. We're going to talk about, about that right now. But if it's something about the process, okay. I agree. Ready? All right. Let's do it. And this is my favorite part, talking about the AFK, because that's where... I specialize in basically. Now, the AFK, the assessment fundamental knowledge. Okay, um, everybody seems ready. Cool. So, what is this exam? It's a multiple choice exam. Okay, and it's basically 300 questions. So, you have to solve 150 questions within three hours, and we give strategies on how to do that. And then you get an hour break, and then you have to solve another 150 questions for another three hours. So, it's pretty much a six hour exam, right? Or, and then if you calculate the hour break, then it's seven hours. Okay, so how do you prepare for this exam? How do you prepare? Um, well, if you're not taking a course, let's say, your main two sources should be release questions, very important, and materials, review materials and books, and we're going to talk about which kind of books. And mainly courses, if you're taking a course or our course, I mean, we have you covered then, right? You don't have to think about yourself by yourself and, and figure things out. Okay, so let's look at material where I said release questions. What do I mean by that? Well, every year the NDEB releases new questions. Okay, the NDEB releases new questions. So, for example, the 2016 release questions may be 300 to 400 pages of questions. However, there's only 200 to 300 new questions. Now, make sure you're, you're looking at the units. I'm not saying there's 200 to 300 new pages of questions. I'm saying from the 300 to 400 pages of questions, right? That could be like thousands of questions, right? So 300 to 400 pages of questions, you could only you, you only probably have 200 to 300 new questions. Okay? And these releases come out every year usually. And you have to work on finding these new questions within the new document every year. That's something we already do for you and kind of provide you with with the best answers and stuff like that. So just that is an advantage, but there's there's new questions every year. So Usually, now, fortunately, the last year, 2019 questions, there were not a lot of new questions, so um, there's not a lot of new ones coming out then. Are release questions to be done only for the latest year or the older ones too? No, you got to do all of them. To be honest, you should do all of them. because Now, there is crossing. Like, you will have similar questions, but some questions are not put in the last one, right? Now, obviously, if you have to choose one set of questions, then do the most recent. Okay, but ideally you you want a combination of all the questions, and that's what we'll provide you. We'll provide you with a base that has all, all from 2010. Don't worry about the errors. We will tell you which one have errors, but there's a lot to learn from them. That's the concept. So from 2010 to 2019, you want to solve all of those. Now, if you're working on your own, that's going to take you forever. 
we've already organized that for you. That's what I'm trying to say. The course helps a lot. We already organized, we already took out the repetitions as much as we can, and we organize them based on a subject, okay? So that's one part. So there's always new questions every year, and, and you have to go through them. Here's a sample of a question, the microorganism. So some questions that come um, could be just selecting one, choose one answer, one answer like this, right? And the answer here is, what do you guys think? Okay, yes, yeah, so the answer is actually B. Okay, so go with B. Okay, so there's another form of questions are like this. Okay, so you can see the difference here, right? So this is called, we, we call this multiple of multiple. So yes, you're choosing one correct answer from here, but you're also kind of thinking, well, which one is it? Is it one, two, and three? Is it one and three? Is it two and four? Is it four only? Is it all of them? So this is called a kind of a multiple of multiple. And here's the thing. These questions do not come in, in the exam anymore. Okay? They don't use this method anymore in the exam. However, it doesn't mean you shouldn't study it. Okay? Because it's important to study. You have to learn from it. You want to learn from most of these, right? Um, and, well, the answer here is, just so you guys, is A. Okay? So what if... This, I'm going to show you why I could do this question. I'm going to remove this. And I'm just going to say, root carries risk in adults is from all, or, or I could say all of the following is true or are true about root carries risk in adults except, you see? And then you would say four. Do you see my point? So, so these questions could be easily converted to these questions, right? And they could remove the key. That's why it's important to learn all the questions. You want to learn from them. Unless there's an error inside the question, then I'll let you know. Is that clear for everybody? What I'm trying to say, why we, the questions you learn from them. And so some questions you learn from, some questions you memorize. Um, so, Dr. Anna, that's a question that you will never get the right answer to. It's different than any exam. So, there will be, the, the answer I'll give you is, if there is a release question in the exam, you better not mess it up. That's, that's, that's what I can tell you. If there's a release, if there's 20 that come from the release in the exam, you shouldn't mess that up. Because those released, you should, if you're taking the course, you should just remember, know the answer so well that there's no time for it anyway. Okay, you just know the answer, right? That's what I think, because a release would be easy to you after. Okay? Now, let me talk about the quality of these questions. And this is where people start to... This is where many people make mistakes and why a lot of people screw up the AFK. I'll be honest with you. This is why. This is one of the reasons. Okay? So, I'm going to explain this. Okay. So, we have questions and concepts when you're studying this big exam. Okay, a lot of questions and a lot of concepts. Now, 95% of these questions and concepts, there's a consensus and we are sure of. Scholars Dental, we have researched, we found solid evidence, and 100% sure that this is the answer or this is the concept that the NDEB wants. Okay? Now, there's always going to be questions that are controversial or confusing concepts that you don't really know exactly what they want because you might find two evidence that support two different answers those are five percent of the questions okay and they require extensive research and even with the extensive research you don't find anything sometimes or most of the time okay so this is a this is something you have to accept okay this is something you have to accept so what's the mistake the mistake is Here's what happens usually with, especially smart students do this, okay? I'm, I'm going to, the smart ones are the ones that do this because they think they, they're perfectionists. They want to get the 100%. They want to solve everything. So what they do is 
they only put 5% of effort into the 95%, and then they put 95% of their effort into the 5%. This is the mistake. This is the big no-no, guys, please. This is the thing that you shouldn't do because you're wasting a lot of your effort and time on 5% of the things, okay? I've had students that they didn't like the answer I gave them for these controversial questions. So they went and researched and researched and researched and then sent me documents and I sent them back. And it's just, why are you, instead of you researching this 5%, why don't you invest this time, 95% of your effort and brain into this and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat until you master that 95%. Isn't that better? The sacrifice is 5%. You're not going to fail because of 5%. You fail because you screwed up the 95%. You see my point? And what we'll do at the course is we'll tell you, look, this is the 95%. Focus on this. Here's the 5%. We're going to give you the answer that we reached after extensive research and that we know the NDEB wants. But you're going to find it weird. You're, going to not, you're not going to believe it or you, it's, it's a tricky question. You're going to have doubt. And you're going to start putting your effort into these. Don't do that. Don't, just don't do that. Just focus on the 95. This is one of the most common mistakes I see people doing and why people waste their time. And, 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 and they, when they get to the exam, they're surprised that the 5% actually doesn't really come. And if it does, it's probably one or two questions. And most of the questions from the 95%, they've forgotten and they can't remember and they make mistakes in them. This is the problem. Okay. Um, Okay, um, you guys get the point? So there's controversial questions that we don't want to focus on, but we'll answer anyway, and we'll give you the, the answer that we reached after extensive research, and there's questions that you have to learn and focus on and repeat. And I'm gonna give you another example of how this works also, okay? I hope this timeline makes sense. I kinda like to make things visual. Um, okay, so imagine you started a course, you took a course with us, and, and it's it's like maybe a four months to five months course, right? Now it's five months because we added more mocks. But so in the beginning, okay, you started say basic science, right? The first subject. We there's a dose of questions. Let's say this dose. Let's say there's like 400 questions. Okay, this this is 400 questions here, and this is the total amount of questions. The the blue line. And according to this theory that I'm telling you about, this 95% to 5%, 95% of these questions are things you need to learn because we're sure of them. You could forget them. That doesn't mean they're easy. It just means that we're 100% sure we found the answer. You need to research, you need to study this. 5% of them we researched and we, we gave you the best answer, but they're controversial questions. They're, they're tricky. You're not sure. There's two right answers. Sometimes there's mistakes, right? If you, if you focus on the 95% and just leave the, the, the 5%, you will benefit yourself because if you keep doing that, what happens is the next subject you do the 95%, the next subject you do the 95%, the next subject you do 95%. By the time you get to the exam, you have achieved your maximum potential overall, you see, because you have completed 95% of all subjects, right? And that's what you want. Let me give you another example. Completing the 95%, let's say, gives you, requires, or gives you, um, let's say, requires, I don't know, let's say 50% time effort, okay? But if you want to get that extra 5%, imagine that extra 5% requires 25%. So is it worth to make your effort 75%? to get that extra five it's not it's not a good it's not a smart investment do you see my point instead why don't you do this twice and and use a hundred percent of your time into 95 or 95 percent it's not worth wasting time on that five percent it's just not because here's what will happen okay listen this is what will happen you will try to perfect it in the beginning this is now the bad don't do this this is the good 95 percent see not trying to perfect it you don't try don't be a perfectionist in these exams be realistic strategy you're trying to get 95% of every subject here's the bad someone th thinking okay i want to get 100% of this first subject okay fine they wasted so much time and they got the 95 and 
And then slowly with time, you see that they're behind, you see? Because they're trying to be perfectionists, they realize slowly that they can't keep up. And then eventually they reach the end of the course that where we have usually ortho, surgery, and radio. And you see that they can't even study those questions because they don't have time. They wasted all their time on trying to get these 5% along with the 95, and then they get here and then they fail at these. Are you guys with me? So what's what's the right thing to do? Keep a steady pace, focus on the important 95% all over the course, throughout the course, okay? And leave the things that bother you. Actually, there's something called, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's the 80-20 rule, if you guys know. What's the 80-20 rule? It's a, it's a time management rule, okay? It says that, 80% of your problems comes from 20% of things. So get rid of the 20%, right? 80, if 80% 80 of your problems is coming from 20% of the things around you, get rid of that 20% so that you don't, you get rid of the 80% of problems. And that's what I'm telling you. There's like an actual time management skill. If all your problems are coming from this 5%, so just get rid of it. Pretend it doesn't exist. And that way you won't have that problem. Another time management rule is Parkinson's law. Well, actually, this doesn't really apply now, so I'll talk about that later. But you guys get the point, I hope, and it's clear. Okay. So what did we conclude? Focus on the 95%. Focus on these. Okay. Okay, there's confusing questions, concepts that are controversial, questions that don't make sense. Sometimes you don't know what to answer. Read them, but just move on. Don't let them. Don't get stuck there. Don't don't be paused. Don't don't uh, don't paralyze yourself. If you see a, a question that's subjective, sometimes those questions are subjective. You might think like, oh, what do they mean by this? Like, I can't find evidence about it. You may never confirm an answer. Sometimes you may never reach an answer. Sometimes these come in a way where it's like, how do you repair a certain filling? Okay, well I could do this and that. So I don't know which one's right. They're both correct. Okay, that may it may feel that way. But you know what? You may never confirm anything, so just move on and, and move on to the next question. Don't waste your time on one specific question. Sometimes you might see questions that have two options, which can be confirmed. Like you can find evidence for two options. So in these questions, move on. Move on right now during the studying. Think about that. Okay, when it does come in the exam, I'll choose them. Don't worry. I'm not going to waste my time studying it. The course will speed up this process, okay? The course will help you achieve your maximum potential. That's what we want to do. We want to get you to that 95% in every subject. That's what we want to speed up. And we want to inform you, look, don't care about this question. Care about this question. Focus on that question. Don't focus on this question. If you have a concern with a question, we'll check it for you and see if, if, if it's worth putting your time into it. We're guiding you. We'll coach you on this, okay? So you don't waste your time. Okay, so what reading materials are good? So we talked about questions, right? We're done with questions. Now we're talking about reading materials. Honestly, if you take the course, the scholar's dental reading material is quite enough. It's enough, and, and I'll show you guys how it looks like soon. Now, if you're not taking the course, then, you know, I want to help people. This orientation is free for everyone, so I want to help people that are not taking courses as well. I, you could read Dental Text Part 1 and 2. Those are good sources. Mosby Review, MBDE, First Aid. These are all material you could read. This is Don't do this altogether. It's going to be too much. Here's what I recommend. If you do not want to take a course, and I think that's not a good idea, but if you don't, if you're, if you're, my recommendation would be do Dental Text Part 2 only and do release questions. That's all. Okay? If you're not... Mosby, I don't like Mosby because... Um, the way Mosby explains things is kind of surface, superficial, and also it's, it's just not deep enough. Okay, you don't get an, you have a lot more info in the Dental Dex Part Two. Don't do Dental Dex Part One if you're doing the Canadian exam because it's very minimal. Okay, most of the things are in Part Two. Okay, so this is what I recommend if you're not taking a course. However, if you're taking a course, I'm gonna give give you a little uh, tutorial of our material. Okay. So example of how to study the dental dex part two if you're not taking the course, because I want to give you guys some benefit if you decide not to take the course as well. Um, pathology is not bad. It's pretty good in the dental dex, but you need to repeat it and organize it, which takes time, which I did already for the course. 
Herodontics, it kind of needs explanation, like flaps. Like, it's just words. It doesn't make sense in the, in the decks. It's kind of hard to understand. Pharmacology in the dental decks is not good for beginners. It's only good if you know it in and out, and then you're reviewing it from the decks. Dental materials, oh, it's lost. Okay, you have some in the restorative section and some in the prosto, and it's all over the place. We've already organized all that in one book. Okay. So pretty much, the, I think the pathology is good. I think the perio is good as well, but it's just, it's hard to understand if you don't know flaps and, and the explanation is difficult. Okay, so what do courses do? What does our course do? Here's the question that I've been asked. Can you pass without courses in 2019? Can you pass? Okay, so embryology and anatomy. Please don't study embryology, guys. <laughs> don't do that. It's such a waste of time. Study the questions that come from the embryology and just memorize the answers. Don't study embryology. I'll teach you anatomy here, but I don't recommend you studying embryology. The time invested for the outcome is not worth it. Okay, this is my strategy. Okay, now, what do can you pass without courses? Here's the thing. I said this before, in 2012 or 13, maybe you could have passed without a course. Why? There was less competition. Less people were taking courses. Maybe the people taking courses were like 30 to 50. Okay? And you have to remember, this is a competition, right? So think about it this way. In 2013, people that studied the release on their own, okay, so let's say these are people that took courses were maybe 30 to 50. And then you have people that were doing it alone, were all the rest. And here you have people who were doing a good job, right? Good. And you have people that were doing not really a good job, right? So maybe the good guys here from the alone study were able to pass along with the people taking courses because there was enough room to allow that out of a thousand, let's say they took, let's say they took 400 or something, right? Or 300. So there was enough room for you to pass. But think about this now. Is this clear for everyone? Maybe you don't know the AFK is a competition, so I'm gonna to have to clarify that. Okay, the AFK, let's say a thousand people take the exam. Let's say they want only 300 to clear. So what happens? They take the best 300 from the thousand. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad. What matters is how good are you relative to the people taking the exam? That's it. So this person could answer, the, this person here could answer maybe 75%. But if 300 people answer 80%, these people will pass and this person will fail. Do you see the point? Let's take another example. This person that prepared very well may answer 70%. But if 700 people answered 65%, this person will pass. So what am I trying to tell you? It's a competition. The 75 mark is not real, okay? It's just like a numerical thing. Yes, if you so if you answer 75 of the questions or 75% of the questions correctly, it doesn't mean you're gonna pass. What it means is that you have to be at the top percentage of the people taking the exam. You have to be the top. So back in 2012 and 13, the people that were taking the courses were not a lot and they were the top, but there was enough room to get people from studying alone to, to kind of pass with them. Let's look at now, 2019. There's probably around, I think I could say safely, 250 people taking courses. So let's say there's only alone, and let's say they only want 50 people to pass, right? And there's people that maybe took the course before, right? The, the, the previous course, so let's say plus 50. So it's really hard to be alone here, right? And even if you're a bad, you're not preparing good um, well, and you're, or, or you are preparing good in a way, you could still fail because you're not, you're not near the people that are doing this, there, we already have all these people that are taking courses, right? So these people are the ones to pass because they're working together. 
And I just want you to think about this logically. What makes you think, logically, think about it, that your single effort on Facebook with people is going to be compared to an effort of this large group that's guided by an experienced uh, course, right? With books and everything. We are just working just to help these people pass, to give them all knowledge. What makes you think you're going to be as good as these people, right? You're going to have to be really, really, really amazing, right? To do that. Like it's, it's, you, you won't, you won't be able to do it on your own unless you, you use more time, right? And it's possible. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just that it's a risk. Okay. Um, so that's why I think that in 2019, it's really hard to pass without a course. And, um, and you, what, what, let me explain something here. So what do courses actually do? Okay. I, I hope this is very clear to you all. Please pay attention to this. This is very important in a way. Um, you'll understand what it, is, what it requires for you to pass. Every student, okay, needs to reach a certain point of knowledge and confidence, right? To pass, okay. So, so this is you again, and this is your scale here, and you need to reach a certain point. Boom, pass. And this is let's say knowledge, right? And 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 memory or whatever, like effort, everything. A course will help you achieve that point more efficiently and faster. We can't change this point for you. We can't make it that you need less to pass. No, you're going to need a certain point of knowledge and experience to pass. What we could do is make it faster for you. We can't change it. Okay. And this depends on the pace of each student. I'm going to give you an example. Okay. One student, because of certain life situations, environment, intelligence, power, age, everything, they may require six months to reach that point to pass. So six months may be what they need without a course to pass. Our course will get them to this point in three months. You see? So this student may, without a course, may need six months, but with a course may need three months. Another student, because of life, environment, maybe also age, maybe intelligence, memory, um, previous experiences, this another student may need a year without a course, but with the course, it will become six months. Do you see the difference? So what I'm trying to say is, it's not we're not a machine. The course is not a machine that will produce student A three months, student A passes. It's not like that. The course will speed up the process of you. So student A needs to climb to this mountain to, to pass. And for them to climb, they need six months. We will make it faster. With the course, you'll need three. Student B needs to climb their own mountain and they need a year, 12 months. With the course, you'll need six months. You see? So you, you're competing with yourself. Don't measure yourself with other people. You shouldn't measure yourself with other people because a person, okay, that's, you know, married, right? And well, I'm just gonna like say, either one could be the dentist and has kids, right? And maybe that's did not, you know, that graduated 30 years ago or 20, and that needs to work, is not going to have the same capacity as someone that just graduated, right? That has maybe parents helping them out, that doesn't have kids, that has all the time they need, right? These are not equal, right? So this person may need maybe, you know, one course and three months to pass. This person may need six, maybe two courses, 
And that's why we have alumni discounts. Some people chose this path. Some of our students took the course once and decided to take it again because when you take it again, you get a really good discount. Okay, so people thought, you know what, we need more time. And that's fine. You have to be realistic with yourself. Don't try to, if you're this person or this person, don't try to be this person. Okay, it's just you have to be realistic with yourself. Check your reality. How much time are you able to give and how long do you think you need? You know, and then if you feel like you need two courses or you need more time, that's fine. You know, that's okay. So that's why we're saying each person has a different pace. The course will definitely speed it up. Okay. Okay, so let's look at how to study. This is very important. I think everything in this orientation is so important that I have to literally keep repeating things like this for my students because they forget, right? But I make this an obligation for them that you have to attend this session in, on March 9 because if you forget this, how to manage your time is more important than actually studying sometimes. Okay. First of all, you have to identify your weak points. That's a common thing. So what I mean by that is you have to learn about what you're forgetting. Right? Like you may be forgetting certain things. You have to learn what is it that I'm forgetting. And those things that you keep forgetting, you learn what they are and you start focusing on them so you keep memorizing them. So you have to learn what you know and what you don't know. And what you're remembering and what you're not remembering. And that takes time to figure out. Okay, and we'll talk about that later a little bit more. You have to read. Give time for yourself to forget and then read again. This will help you memorize things better. Look at this trick or this concept. Reading something five, five times over five months is better than reading it five times over five minutes. Okay, have you ever done this? Have you ever done this where you're reading a page and you read it once and then you read it twice and you read it three times within five minutes? You think that if you read it more, you're going to memorize it more? Honestly, that doesn't work. The truth is you have to read it, sleep, read it again another time after maybe a month, read it again after a month. That's how you get the memory of it. Reading it all at once really counts just one. Like if you read it five times in five minutes or 10 minutes in one session, you really it's really you reading it once. Reading it twice means reading it once, waiting a week or two, then reading it again, or even a month, right? That's real reading because you have to let yourself forget it. Why? What, what's happening here? Well, when you read it once, what you're doing is you're getting the info into your brain, okay? Um, that's your brain. You're getting the info into your brain. Reading it again and again and again, right, doesn't do anything. It's just the info is already in your brain. But what you want to do is now you want to give yourself maybe a time, maybe like three weeks or even a month or whatever, whatever how long it takes you to cycle through your material. Now, when you read it again, okay, after the, the month, when you're reading it again, what you're really doing is you need to test yourself. You need to see, can you relocate this information in your brain? It's more about relocating it. So you're kind of like looking for it, right? That's like supposed to be a, a search thing. You're, look, you're relocating this information in your brain. Now, you may feel like, hmm, I can't do it. I can't recall this information. So you need to read it again. So when you read it again, you kind of have to trigger a pathway. You have to learn how to look for it in your brain, right? And the more you practice this, the better. So imagine your brain is like this, and here's the info, and you're here, and you're kind of like digging through, looking for this info. You're digging, you're digging, you're digging. Oh, you found it, right? Next time, you'll be like, oh, I know where it is, and you'll refine it better. And then all of a sudden, you start memorizing it faster because you, you learn where the info is. You, you learn how to recall it, okay? So it's not about reading it 20 times in one session. That's not helping. It's reading it multiple times in different sessions. Is that clear? So that's a, a thing to study as well. Another thing, you'll never remember 100% of what you read. Never. You'll never. No matter how much time you spend on it. So why bother spending so much time on it? Just read it and, and, and read it maybe twice and move on. Right? You see my point? You'll never remember 100% of what you read. And this is why I use this strategy with you guys as well. 
Okay, if I gave you, if I, if I, okay, this is me, right? If I read something and then I summarized it from 100% to 10% minimum that you need, and if you read this 10%, you're only going to retain 1% of the 10%. So you're going to retain 10%, right? You're going to retain. So you're not actually memorizing the whole 10%. So what I do is, this is what I do. I read something, the 100%. And what I do, instead of summarizing to the minimum 10%, I try to summarize it maybe 50%. That way, when you read it, you're going to get, you know, 5% of that important stuff. You're going to retain more. And what I do is I direct you. I tell you, remember this part of it, remember that part. When you have a lot of writing and someone tells you, remember this specific point, you remember it better than if I only gave you this and told you, remember the whole thing. Okay. It's just like, it's just the way the brain works, right? Like if I give you all of this, and I tell you, remember this and this. Or I could give you those two sentences only and tell you, remember this. Which one is better? This one is better. When you see little among a lot, you'll memorize it easier. If you see little in little, you'll just find it that, whoa, I have to memorize 100% of this, right? But here, you'll, psychologically, it works better. So that's another trick we do also. Okay, go through 15 pages quickly. This is a technique I use. Go through 15 pages quickly, then read them over again. It's better than reading one page over and over again. So, like, what I used to do is I had 10 cards, okay, from the decks. And I used to go through card 1 to 10, number 10. And then I used to go back to card one, read it again to 10. Instead of reading card one, 10, two times, and then card two, two times, and card three. Why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm allowing myself to forget. So what I do is I go from card one to card 10. Now I kind of forgot card one, so I go back and test myself in card one and then go through again. It's better than doing each card on itself more than once. Okay? And create questions. So you want to create questions to help you Test yourself so that you don't have to repeat things. And I'm going to show you some examples. Okay, first, how do you study for the first time? Okay, so you're going through material. And this is um, this is applies only if you're going through the dental decks, okay? When you're going through our material, it's going to be different. But if you're studying the dental decks for the first time, read. But just know that you'll forget, for sure. You're going to forget. Anything you read, you're going to forget for the first time. It's like you never read it before. So that's why it's important to try to finish the first reading fast. Don't try to perfect it. Just read. Just read it and move on. Why? The first reading is like kind of just figuring out what is in the material. That's it. It's like, imagine like a first date kind of thing. You're just like getting to know the person or first meeting. You're just getting to know them. You're, they're not your friends. You don't know a lot about them, but you're just getting to know them. So th you're just getting to know the material. So try to understand it. That's fine. Try to learn it. But... Just don't, don't spend so much time. The second time, and oh, obviously, when you're reading it the first time, my recommendation is don't write notes your first time. The reason is I did this before, and when I read the decks for my first time, I ended up writing notes, and what I ended up writing is basically the whole decks because everything seemed important to me, <laughs> right? But when you get through your second and third time, you go like, oh, actually, I don't need to write this anymore, right? The second time, Try to learn and understand information that seems new to you. Try to test yourself. See what looks new. And here, maybe you could start creating questions. So, like, let's say I'm reading a card, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I already know penicillin is a narrow spectrum, um, you know, bactericidal. So I don't need to read that anymore. So now what I'll do is maybe I'll create a question saying in the beginning of the card, what type of antibiotic is penicillin? So that on my third reading, I could test it. And if it's right, then I don't have to do it anymore. But right now, I know that I remember this. So I'm, 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 almost, I'm almost deciding not to read it anymore because it's easy. You see? Try this. And then your third time, try to use the questions you created. So, or take a peek at the card. 
to see what you remember and what you don't. So if you've created questions on the front of the card, these will give you an idea of what you remember, and then you answer them. If you find yourself you remember most of the card, that means you're, you're, you, that information is easy for you. You don't need to read it on your fourth reading. So that means these things that you remember in your third reading from your second, they became raw information. They're just, you know them now. They're, they're part of your logic. So if you, you have to figure out what information you keep forgetting and what's, what information you remember. And this is different for each person. So that way you cross out the sections that are easy to you. Because why read something that's easy to you? And this will make your fourth reading easy and more efficient. So actually, at the end, for me, the first time I read the decks, it took me seven months because I was doing 10 cards a day. The fourth time I read the decks, it took me two weeks. See the difference? Why? Am I, am I a miracle? No, I'm not a miracle. What I did is I crossed out things. So if I had a card and it looked like this, I would say I don't need to read this part anymore. I need to read this sentence because I kept, I remember this now. And I don't want you to highlight important things. That's not what you highlight. What you highlight is things you forget. Is that clear? For example, penicillin is a bactericidal. That's important to know. But it doesn't even have to highlight it just because it's important. I already know it. It's easy. Right? I need to highlight things I forget, like... You know, um, dilacerations are associated with itchy thiosis. Like something like that is something I feel like I'll forget. I'll highlight that, you know. That's the difference, okay. All right, so what our course will do. What, what is it that the course will do for you? We have organized the information, guys. So you don't have to go out and organize it and look for it. We have understood it. It takes time to understand things, right? Like you have to go... If you want to understand one card from the decks, you probably have to look at a bunch of YouTube videos to get it, figure it out and read books. We already done that. We provide you the organized material. So we're going to give you the organized, we'll help you understand all of it and all the tough concepts that would have taken you days to get. We have researched all the questions, no doubt, and you just have to follow our answers and understand it. And some things we'll tell you to memorize. We'll tell you what to memorize and what to understand. We will help you achieve the four readings result faster okay so four readings instead of taking you a year to do we'll, we'll we'll shorten that for you depending on your own effort as well here's an example of one of my cards just to show you how i studied because i didn't have anyone that made lectures like for me so i had to study from the decks so look at this is one of my cards and this is about the primordial cyst you see about the primordial cyst and you can see on my when i got to my fourth reading this is how it looked like Okay, let's see. It arises from cystic changes in the developing tooth bud before the formation of enamel. Okay, that seemed important, so I left it. But I already know it. Since the primordial cyst arises from a tooth bud, the tooth will be missing from the... I already know that. I know that the tooth will be missing. I already know that. It's too easy for me now. The mandibular third and fourth molar region are most common. I found that the fourth molar was something weird, so I kept that. It is, I might forget that. Now here, it is usually found in children and young adults. From between 10 and 30. I mean, I felt that was something I would never remember and it's not relevant. Like, how am I gonna remember 10 to 30? That's like, I'm just not gonna remember that. It's gonna waste my time. Because if I have to do it for one disease, why not do it for the rest, right? How does it look like radiographically? It's a cyst, so it's a circular radio lucency with a radio pack border. Don't all cysts look like that? So why am I even memorizing it? There's no point, it's a regular cyst, so I'm just gonna cross this out. So that's what I did. Oh, until conclusive proof is established, primordial cysts and endontogenic keratosis are considered separate entities. Sure. Um, if a tooth with a radicular cyst at its apex is extracted, the radicular cyst is left behind in bone is now called a residual cyst. I already know that, so I crossed it out. That's easy now to me on my fourth reading. So what I really ended up reading was this sentence on my fourth reading and this sentence, you see? And that saves so much time. I don't need to read all the English, the proper English in between. So here's another one also, just showing you how I would study with crossing things out. I also cross out symptoms that are not helpful, okay? Like, first of all, I know most tumors are in the posterior mandible, so I don't need to memorize that. It's asymptomatic. Well, I'm going to assume it's asymptomatic until someone tells me it's symptomatic, you know? So just like stuff like that. Here's the front part of a card. So I used to... 
I used to test myself, read the question, and see if I get the right answer. And if I get the right answer, I start doing the check mark, meaning I don't need to read the question, save time. And I create questions on the on the on the front end of the card about the back of the card. So most common odontogenic tumor is, and I cover I cover this part with my hand, and I try to answer the most common odontogenic cyst, the most common odontogenic. Um, the most common non-odontogenic cyst, all that. And then if I find these all correct, then I don't need to read it anymore. So this is my third reading, preparing for my fourth in that question area. Here's other things I have crossed out. Another trick is you could take info from one card. Let's say you have this card here, and there's one sentence that you need from it, or two. So I take it, and I write it on this card, and then I, I just get rid of the whole card, which makes it less for me to read at the end of the day, less cards to go through. Efficiency, guys, right? So anything that will help me um, be efficient. Naming the card. Wow, this was really important. A good thing I did this, crossing out the questions. So in the decks, it's all over the place. So what I used to do is I used to name the card. This card is about dentigeresis. And then after a bunch of cards, I find another one that is about dentigeresis. So I name it, dentigeresis. And then after a few other cards, I find another one. So what I did at the end is I gathered all the cards are about dentigeresis and put them together, and all the cards about this thing, about, until at the end, I had my own organization of the decks. My decks do not go alphabetically. If you see my decks, they go based on topics, and, and based on, and all each disease is combined with its disease. So you'll see all the cards that are about dentigeris together, all the cards are about, um, and you can see here I have dentigeris and bonds, because it has both topics. So a very, it took me a long time to do that. So that's one thing with those. And we have done that for you in the course, plus things from books. Now, so you have to do the same with questions. And it's really important to do it with questions. So if you have release questions, like let's say you have question one, question two, question three, question four, question five. Okay. Question two, the first time you answered it, you were correct. All right, fine. Give yourself, doubt yourself a bit. The second time you answered it, you were correct. So why are you doing it a third time? You don't need to do it anymore. You answer this question correctly. The only reason you do it is because your own fear, your own confidence. Don't let that confidence take, take you out. Okay, question three. The first time I answered it, I was wrong. So I'm going to keep it. Question four. The first time I answered it, I was wrong. Maybe the second time I was right. And the third time I was right. So I'm going to cross it out now. I learned it. So now on your fourth reading, you, you minimized, you, you kind of took out 50% of the things you need to read in questions, right? I'll tell you the truth. People like to read all questions. You think this is a good thing, but it's really because they're lazy. Okay. <laughs> you might be surprised why I'm saying that. Well, because if you're reading question one and it's easy, then isn't that kind of laziness? You, don't want, you, you, you want to make yourself feel good and read an easy question and solve it. Question two, easy. You want to read it and make yourself feel good? Go ahead, but you're wasting time. No, those easy things, cross them out and, and focus on the hard things that you keep forgetting. And don't be lazy, cross them out and don't try to make yourself feel good. Try to make yourself improve. You, you're, you're, it's not about making yourself feel good about these easy questions that you know how to answer them. If you already know how to answer them, cross them out and start focusing on the ones you don't know how to answer. Even if it might make you feel bad, but hopefully it'll get you the right mark, right? So cross out the questions you keep answering correctly. Reading a question in its options is time consuming. So if you know that you know the correct answer, then it's a waste of time. All right. <clears throat> How to use the course. The course is a guide. We will teach you as much as we can. We believe we are teaching you at a higher quality than your dental school. To be honest, we are. Like, I, I, I am sure of that. And in less time. We obviously are not, we're not teaching, teaching you dentistry from scratch, but we almost are. We're repairing your dentistry. Okay? We are, we, are, we are helping you understand the things your dental school skipped. Okay? So sometimes in school, we all had some gaps that we didn't understand, right? And, and maybe you, a lot of things were ignored, like understanding proper perio, understanding a lot of different things. And... We will overcome all of that and try to help you understand everything. Okay. Um, and I really believe we're doing a great job at it. Like, I'll tell you how we started the course later on, just to kind of 
see how this whole thing started. So how to use the course? Our teaching style accomplishes two goals, guys. The first main goal is to pass the AFK exam. And the other goal is to actually learn dentistry at a higher level. And we're going to keep the balance between learning what you want, what you need for the exam and also for being a good dentist here. Look, there's some there's something is actually this is really important to me personally, like the AFK, because I believe that we coming from other countries, okay, I don't think we all got the best education we can, especially in pharma, right, and patho knowing things about perio, diagnosis, how to diagnose endo, how to treat it properly, all that stuff. We missed out on a lot of things. And I'll be honest with you, once you pass the AFK, you're never going to want to come back and study like the AFK again. Let's say you're done. You're going to move on with ACS, ACJ. ACJ is not even a place to really learn. You apply the AFK. So ACJ, you, you just apply what you learn from the AFK. AFK is the basis for you to be a good, that's why it's called fundamental knowledge. It's the foundation. And I want to build that foundation for you. I'll help you build that foundation if you let me. So you'll never get another chance to learn things, to actually take a step back from your life and go like, okay, I need to repair my dentistry just for one year or six months, and hopefully that will repair everything. And, and it will, I'm telling you, this will go a long way with you into ACJ, into your practice. I, I promise you, you'll, you'll be a benefit from this all the way up to your practice, okay? You will, the things you'll learn here, the information in this course is really important for being a dentist. Patients here, guys, patients in Canada, uh, it's not like, you know, if you're in Egypt or in, in Syria, like I studied in Damascus in Syria. Patients here, and doctors even, physicians, will expect a practicing dentist to know these things. A patient will come to you and give you a list of medications expecting you to know kind of what 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 can you do what you're not allowed to do if a doctor talks to you and says oh that's you know an anticoagulant or that's an anticholinergic and you're like i don't know what that does to the body you you heard it's going to be embarrassing it's not, no one's going to trust you as a doctor right so for your own sake really you should learn the afk properly okay and also will help you with the acj Okay, and for being a better doctor, you won't get this other. No one's going to teach you these things later on. If you become a dentist, you're not going to have a dentist coming to teach you these things. This is your opportunity to correct it, to build the foundation, and hopefully from here you'll feel like you did. You may, I'm sure you'll you'll see that you made the right decision to becoming a doctor here. If you don't do it now, and you pass somehow, luckily by luck, the AFK. Like if you get lucky and you pass the AFK. And you didn't. You do not correct your foundation. You will. You'll never find a time to do it. How are you going to do it on your own? You can always come back and take the AFK. But why not do it now? Why do it later when you're already practicing, right? What if you got hired by someone? And someone is telling you, "Oh, don't do this and, and don't give this medication." And you're like, "I don't know why. I just don't. I don't know what this medication is." Or you're, you're consulting a physician. Just don't. I think it's a really important foundation. Okay. Now another thing about studying. Um, this part here. And this goes back to the, this is another way I want to look at it. And I want to show you this diagram because I created this diagram to show you how to study for the exam. Okay, guys, we're almost, I know we're almost getting to the demonstration. I know it's a little bit beyond, but we started a little bit late waiting for other people to come in, right? So look at this diagram. This is all the knowledge. Imagine this is all the knowledge, all the anatomy knowledge, all the implant knowledge, all the radiology knowledge. This is, there. Are, imagine this whole circle is all the knowledge of dentistry, okay? What you need to learn as a general dentist is you need to learn the fundamentals of everything. The fundamentals of everything, right? This green area is the fundamental of everything, okay? That's what a general dentist is, okay? So, an, uh, let's say an orthodontist. An orthodontist will have this green area plus this. Right, so that's a specialist. That's what they'll have, right? Um, you know, and let's say a periodontist will have this green area plus the perio, right? They'll have extensive knowledge in perio. That's fine, but you need to know that green area. Okay, let me show you how the questions in the exam actually come. They come like this. So let's just show you. This shows you that most of the questions come from the green area you see 
they will come. So as long as you know the green area, you're going to answer most of the questions. Okay. Now, will you get questions from details? Yes, you may get a question from a detailed anesthesia. You may get a few questions, maybe from dental materials, maybe from restorative, maybe something from radiology that only specialists know, maybe something very complicated in basic science. That's the min that's very minimum though, okay? I know for sure these questions are not the questions that will cause you to fail. It's messing up in the green area here that causes you to fail. So the strategy is focus your effort on mastering this green area, okay? And let's say there's a question that came from dental material here. What you do is you just learn that answer for that specific question. Don't go thinking, well, I need to know about all of this. For example, let's say they had a question about um, cosmic x-rays, you know? One question about cosmic, one time in one exam, this happened. And then I had a student that was like, oh, we have to read about cosmic x-rays because they're bringing questions from them. No, you don't, you don't. They brought one question, memorize it, don't let it distract you, don't go reading this so that you guarantee cosmic x-rays and focus on the green. Why? Because the details in the next exam may be like this, look, I may flip the star. If I flip the star, is the green area changing? No, most of the questions are still from that green area. You see? So if you, if you study the green area and master it, you will pass. But the details now are from pathology, from infection control, maybe from anatomy, maybe something from perio, maybe something from ortho. The details change. These are the hard questions. Who cares about them? Don't worry about them. Focus on the green area. That's what will help you pass. For you to guarantee these detailed questions in every exam, what do you have to do? You have to expand your knowledge so that it covers all of this, like this, right? That's how you have to expand. Let's, let's make that blue, right? You have to expand your knowledge to cover all of that. Is that possible, you think? No way. This will take you like, you have to be a specialist in everything, basically, right? Don't waste your time on that. What you need to do is focus on the green area and master that. And you have to recognize what questions are too detailed and how to deal with them. And we help you with that, okay? Does that make sense? Thank you, yes. <laughs> it's really important to understand this, okay? Because if you, if you focus on those details, I'm telling you, you will get lost. How many people I've seen that focus on details, I just tell them, look, just don't worry about it. Just focus on what I'm giving you and that part memorize. So it's really about, you have to know when to let go, man. You know, you have to know when to let go. This question, I'll tell you, let it go. Memorize and let it go, okay? This question, I'll, I'll explain to you because I think the concept is important for your dental benefit and for your AFK exam, you know? I'll, I'll help you with that. But you have to trust us, okay? Now, so what are we going to do? What am I going to do, okay, in the class? Well, if you guys are taking online, I am here to give you my knowledge and experience, okay? I'm here to give you my knowledge and experience. Let me make that red. For some reason, the red looks nicer. And I'm going to give you my knowledge and experience that I think are important. I know these are important. I want to teach you the green. This is what I want to do. My job as, as teaching you for the AFK, the foundation, is to teach you that green area and help you understand it. Now, I will give you some of the red areas because I'm the instructor, so I have the green area that I need to teach you, but I also have some red areas that I feel like I'm kind of responsible for teaching you because I'm the instructor, and I believe they're helpful. Only go in details if you see questions asking about those specific details, and don't, don't try to surround the detail. So if there's a detail about a question, from dental materials, learn that answer. Don't try to surround every info about that. You got a question about, I don't know, um, something in gypsum or something that's very detailed in the lab or wax, memorize it. But it doesn't mean you have to go read all the Phillips of waxes and everything, right? Like you have to be very specific here. Okay? And we will always come across new concepts. That's not gonna change. There's always new things we'll learn. And we're here to support that. We, we, we will go through things. We always do it. I'm not here to answer all the questions you have about dentistry. That's impossible, right? Like, this is what happens sometimes, you know, um, 
this is the story of your life. You are a second year dentist. Okay. You know, second year, you're all excited. You ask your instructor about something about um, amalgam. You you have a wrong concept about it from back then. You, it's uh, There's a question in your head about something specific. I'm in class, you know, talking about uh, maybe dental materials, right? This is me, and I'm talking about dental materials. And all of a sudden, like, you go like, oh, I have a question. This What's the answer? You, you either ask about this question that you have in your head that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, or you start asking, this is what I see all the time. You, you you take a release question and you look at an option that's B and you ask me that option. You know, like, does amalgam contract when you do this and that? And I'm like, wait, I'm not even talking about that. Can you, <laughs> like, you're asking me a question out of the topic a bit. So, every, and, and the thing is, I have a bunch of you that's like that, right? So, you may have curiosities, you may have different questions, you may have different questions. So, and you, everybody's going to have different details, right? Everybody has different details. So the way I like to, to, to illustrate this is like this, okay? I'm the instructor here, okay? And I have knowledge H. Let's call this knowledge H, okay? My job is to give you knowledge H. Now you, as a student, you have different experiences because we are not, we're not all from one university. So you have different knowledge and experience and background. So you have knowledge A. This person here has knowledge B. This person here has knowledge C, right? This person here has knowledge D. Now, my job as an instructor is to give you my knowledge, okay? I don't want to, honestly, I don't want you to pass around knowledge A, B, C. I don't want to hear that because it's going to confuse others. What I want to do is give you knowledge H, give you knowledge H, give you knowledge H, give you knowledge H, right? Now, each one of you is going to have a unique combination. This student here is going to have a combination A plus H. This student is going to have B plus H. This one C plus H, this one D. It's a different combination. Now, let's say student A, something from his past knowledge contradicts something that I told him. For this exam, take my my what I'm telling you to do for just for the sake of the exam at least I don't care what you have from your experience take take my advice okay take my knowledge for the exams for, for the sake of the exam um, now if something in your knowledge really contradicts and you really believe in it don't shout it out in class imagine you start shouting out no this is the correct thing right this person has no idea what you're talking about because he has different background this person maybe and and now you spread out this different knowledge to other students. So instead of doing that, take my knowledge, combine it with yours, your knowledge, and then you could kind of make a unique combination to see which what's correct and what's not correct. And if there's any contradiction, ask me privately or email us, right? And then what we'll do is we'll look into it and see if you're correct or not. But we don't want to, there's two things that you may do if you throw in details from your, from your mind, especially if you're like a specialist or an orthodontist, let's say. There's two problems with this. It's not that I don't like education. I love knowledge. I like spreading knowledge. I like, I like sharing, but I want to protect everybody. So the, the thing here is, first of all, you might shout something out, knowledge A, and it may be incorrect for the exam, and now you corrupted everybody's brain with that knowledge. And now they can't remember what was the right thing. Was it this or that, right? And you confused everybody. That's one thing. Second thing is that it may not be really important for us. Like, imagine an ortho student is like, He's, you know, you're excited about your specialty and you're like, hey, you know, like when you push a tooth, this is really what happens and this is what, what goes on. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't really care about that because there's no questions about it. But what you made everybody feel is that they're understudying. So now you messed up their confidence. Everybody feels like, man, I don't know anything about that. Am I, am I not good enough? And you're just making people feel bad. That's the problem. So there's two problems with you throwing out your own personal knowledge in class. Now, this may not apply to you if you're online because you're not going to have that. But when you throw it out in class, you may make everybody else feel, you know, not doing good enough, basically. Or it may be wrong and you're just corrupting their the ideas and messing up the question. Okay. So just want you guys to kind of, you have to acknowledge this is the reality because what we're dealing is with not, we're not working with students from, univer from one university, we're working with people, different age groups, different histories, different backgrounds. So we have to, just take my knowledge and then combine it with your own and make your own combination. 
you don't have to tell me about it, but if you have any contradiction, then you could come and say, hey, you know, I think this, maybe this is wrong, and then I'll look into it and see if it's wrong. And if I find that it makes sense what you're saying, then I will make it my duty to inform everybody. Don't worry about that. We all we would do that. Like, we don't mind changing things if you're correct. Okay. So, where are we now? We will always come across new concepts. I'm not here to answer all your questions you had in the past. Don't worry. That thing... Don't worry about being, uh, you know, about, sometimes you have to not worry too much about learning, okay? I want you to learn what you need, and that's something I'm going to tell you right now. So I cannot compete with Google also, so don't, like, look up stuff in class if you're coming to class. It's kind of, like, rude. It'll break the flow. Let me finish what I have to give you, and then you can go and research whatever you want afterwards. So I'm here to give you what you need and put highlight need, not what you want, okay? Yes, you want to learn all the cool things about ortho and surgery and everything, but I'm going to I'm here to give you what you need to pass and to also be a good general dentist. I'm not here to to like satisfy your wants of learning. I like to learn, but I do that on my own time. When it comes to AFK, I'm teaching you what you need for AFK plus being a dentist, but I'm not here to make you an exceptional orthodontist or something like that. That's not my job. I'll be honest, I I don't do ortho. I don't do ortho, okay? I'm not an orthodontist, but I know what I need to pass, okay, for ortho and to get high marks. I even know how to answer all the questions almost. Like I know I know the questions. I know I know what they want from them. That's my job, okay? I've done uh, I've done uh, Invisalign course. I don't do ortho. You as an orthodontist, if you are an orthodontist, you might have you're going to have more experience, right? But if you're going to be stubborn and not follow the, the, you might answer questions based on your experience that are incorrect, right? So that's why you have to also, like, take our AFK. Now, I, I do consult with orthodontists. Sometimes you're, you're, uh, there's some questions that need experience, right? But again, I, I might pass better, I might answer ortho questions better because I just, I know how to answer them. It's not based on experience. I know, I know what I need to know to pass, right? And then you could, after you finish, you could go and learn and become and take whatever course you want after, okay? Now, if there is something you think is important from the details, from the red area, fine, that's fine. Go and search it on your own and add it to what I gave you. I gave you knowledge H, right? You have knowledge A. You think there's something important. That's fine. You go on your own and add it to your knowledge. If I don't think it's important, I don't think it's my duty to spread it to all the students, you see, because I don't want to confuse. If you think it's important, you may be right. Go, go. That's your job to do it. Okay. Um, I I give you what I think is important, and that's been working for our students. And you could form study groups with your classmates, and you'll have more time to do things like that because I've solved all the green area for you, so you have time to meet with your classmates and do stuff. One of you may we already talked about this. One of you may know more, more than me in a specific area, like if you're a specialist. So don't mention detailed information in class because simply it's going to either confuse other people, it could easily be wrong, right? Or it could uh, make other people feel like they're not studying. So I'm just going to go through these because we already talked about it. If you have detailed information about the red area, right, the red area, not the, not the green area that you want to share, first send it to me in an email. I will decide if it's important for the AFK. I, I need to be the filter, okay, my, me, my staff and I. Um, Dr. Hajar is, is helping, so me, uh, Dr. Hajar and, and I will be the filter to see what's important. Please do not share in class because it could simply be wrong or not even important enough. Like, why are you adding more work for people that's not important? You know, you don't need, I'm filtering what you need. You don't need to know biomechanics of orthodontics, for example. The bio, biomechanics, there's like a 200-page book just about biomechanics and ortho. You don't need to know that. I, I, I thought I did when I was studying at first, but I learned what I need from the questions. So you, you don't want to make other people feel that they, they are not studying, and you don't want to introduce concepts that are not important. To be honest, okay, if your information is not really helping to solve a controversial question, and it's not really helping in the green area, how about we all just decide not to care about it for now, okay? We don't, you don't need to care about this concept right now. Classroom time is limited. This doesn't apply really to online, but in the class we, are, we have limited time, so I don't want to waste time on things I don't think are important. 
And you're free again to do your own study groups and stuff. And another thing, praise in public and criticize in private. If you think we have something wrong, we are very open to corrections to, to your info. Don't mention it during the lecture because it breaks the flow if you're in class. Um, if you have something you feel like should be corrected, um, contact us privately and we'll look into it before changing anything. If we made a mistake, we are we will we will correct it and inform everyone about this mistake. We're human after all. And this and many times people that want to that think we have mistakes, almost I'll say 90 percent, 95 maybe percent of the time, um, they'll come back in a week and say, oh, sorry, you know, you're right. And why why am I saying don't mention it in class? If you mention it in class, the students that heard that answer, they're like, was it B or A? I remember there was a confusion about this question. Was it B or A? Dr. Hafez said B, but then someone said A, and then they said they'll research it, so we're not sure. Why do that? Why create that confusion? First, let them take the answer that's B. That's it. They memorize that's B now. And if you have confusion, tell me. I'll go, we'll go look into it. And if we find that we want to switch, because most of the times we don't need to switch. Most of the times the, I, the student is um, confused about something, and we will fix it. But if we do switch, then we'll, for, we'll formally email everybody. So guys, support each other, but don't neglect yourself. In class, I barely get any breaks anyway. I'm always there to answer questions. Online, um, we, I'm going to show you what we've done for you online um, to help you with questions as well. Support each other, but don't neglect yourself. And this is where you may kind of not like this because it's the truth of the competition. Look, I am the type that encourages the spread of knowledge. I love teaching. This is why I'm doing it, right? Um, it's something I like to do. However, the reality is the exam is a competition. So, yeah, you want people that are in one course, like if you're all taking scholars, you're all, you all should be on the same team, should be helping each other out. And when I went to the exam center this time, I saw all my students gathered up after the exam. It felt good. I like they're, they're on one team. They're all coming out, talking about the questions by them, like with them, you know, like with each other because they're on the same team. So care for your classmates, help each other out. You don't want to create any kind of negativity between classmates. However, if you're going to share with others outside the course, I mean, that is your choice, but just know that, first of all, they may not share the same with you, and they may pass and you may fail. If you share knowledge, I'm going to tell you some things here. If I'm scholars here, I'm giving you all the tricks to pass to, you know, 20 people. If you go share that with people outside the course, what are you really doing? Remember, it's a competition. Aren't you just making your competition better? I mean, do you think, do you think that's fair? Do you think that this person here that, that you know, did not want to put the effort to attend the course, did not want to overcome the obstacles, did not pay, you know, four to five thousand dollars for a course, Right? This person deserves the same that you deserve, that you, you want, you did all the effort, right? Why are you giving this person an advantage over you by knowing all this knowledge? He's your competitor, right? Remember, I, I know this sucks, but it's the truth. This is a game. And the top will win. The top percentage will win this game. So people that are taking the course, you're all getting the same knowledge. So don't compete among each other. Try to help each other out. But if you're giving people that are outside the course that did not want to put the effort to attend and, and, and pay for a course, then why are you giving them the advantage to be better? What if they're hiding info? What if they're hiding, what if they're collecting info from you and then they're collecting info from others and all of a sudden they're super awesome at a lot of things and then they pass and you here, you're not. Why are you improving your competition, right? And I'm not trying to be like um, rude about this, but what I'm trying to say is that um, if you uh, you are only responsible for your success at this point, guys. Okay, you may have care for others more than what they have for you, and after you pass, go ahead and help others. But right now, you're the one that needs help. Okay, and you know it's only fair to say like, okay, this person might tell you. I know how it is because I've been in that position. This person might tell you. So I'm teaching you here. Okay, may say, yo, you know, I, I need help. Right, like help me out. I need help. Come on, help me. Okay, and, and, and you don't want to look like someone that's not helping. What, what's the right thing to do, really? Okay, you need help too. I also need help. I'm not in a better situation than you, but I took the effort to take this course. 
okay, you need help, why don't you go to Dr. Hafez to go to Scholar's Dental and register? They'll help you. I'm not, you're no place to help other people really right now. You need the help. I'm helping you, right? If someone needs help, tell them, okay, go to Scholar's Dental and you'll get help. Why are you asking me? I'm, I'm not, when I pass, I'll help you. That's what you should tell them. But right now, I need help. I, I don't have time to 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 sit down and, and, and make you better, right? So that's just an idea. And we do take a limited number of students in class, and, and also um, we're thinking of limiting the number online just to make it um, that not everybody gets this stuff every year. Um, so why do people fail? Is it knowledge? Well, basically, we sorry, we limit the number in class mainly for quality because people get to have uh, more interaction that way. Okay, so why do people fail? And this is where someone was asking about um, um, the fear. So people fail. Is it because of knowledge, you guys think? Honestly, most of the time it's not. People come out of the exam complaining about the hardest questions. Oh, they brought a question about why, um, you know, bunnies eat rabbit, uh, why rabbits eat carrots or something like that. Really weird question. Yeah, they brought those questions, sure, but that's not what made you fail. I am 100% sure you failed because you, you um, answered incorrectly an easy or average question and other people's other people answered it correct that's why you failed and I'll tell you the truth here from my experience from mock exams people that are good students that are like students that know their stuff choose the wrong option sometimes like they know the answer is a but they choose C and then when they realize after the mock that they chose C instead of a they're surprised why does that happen guys stress right it's confusion so there's a lot of things that happen in the exam that has nothing to do with knowledge, okay? Now, most people fail because they answer average questions wrong. People don't fail because of difficult questions. They fail because you missed an easy or average question. So that's why it's important to focus on what others know. That's why if you're not taking the course, I tell people that focus on the decks. Why? Because most people are studying the decks. So you want to know what most people know. If you focus on what people don't know, and then you kind of leave or forget the things that everyone knows, you'll start to go into the failing area because it's a competition. It's not about how good can you answer the difficult questions. It's about how make sure you answer all the average and easy questions correctly. And if you take the course and study hard and follow our instructions, honestly, knowledge is not the reason you fail. Okay. So if you follow our methods and instructions, you'll pass. And knowledge is not the reason. And when I say instructions, I mean knowledge wise and psychologically and that's how you'll pass so why do people then mess up questions well really i found that's three main things fear and stress confidence and expectation those three things is what really surprises people in the exam and during studying okay so let's start with one fear and stress look fear could be a good thing and a bad thing okay so you need the right amount of fear because some fear will get you studying right but too much will cause stress and could block your clarity, right? So how can you manage fear? Look, look at this as an enjoyable opportunity to learn. Don't look at it as you being tested, you see? Don't look at yourself as you're being tested and you're being judged. You're not being judged. You, you really, you, this is how you have to think about it. You really want to pass when you deserve to pass, okay? You don't want you don't want to pass out of luck. This is how your mentality should be. So what you want to do is you want to work hard. And if you don't pass, then you have to blame yourself a little bit. Don't blame the NDB. Say that, oh, okay, that's fine. I didn't reach that point where I deserve to pass yet. So I just have to read more. Okay. You read more and then eventually you'll get to the point where you pass. So don't don't put that stress that you're being judged. No one is judging you. The exam is not really like don't look at it as a test. It's just saying, okay. We, we want you to be a dentist here, but you're just not ready yet, so just study more. That's, a, that's basically what the exam is doing. It's not saying, hey, you suck, you can't be a dentist. It's not saying that. It's saying, oh, okay, we want you to be a dentist, but you're just not ready yet, so study more and hopefully you'll get there. That's what the exam is. And you don't want to pass by luck. Some people are proud that they pass like, you know, without studying. That's not good. You don't want to be a, like, you could, if you pass by randomness, that's not a good thing. You don't want to be a dentist that doesn't know what their pharmacology, right? So just look at it that way. Um, 
we're all dentists and I look at us as scholars. We want to enjoy learning the concepts that our dental school, school never taught. And I'm going to help you with that. And it's going to be fun. Like, I hope that you'll be fun. If you see um, some of my students talking about the pharmacology, they find it fun now. So there's an opportunity to actually understand really cool stuff. So try to look at the exam as not an exam or a test for you. Try to look at it as, okay, I'm, I have to become something. I have to improve myself to deserve to pass. And, and that's something good. You're improving yourself. You need a method also to relax, you know, whatever works for you, walking, uh, yoga. And, you know, don't look at life. It's all AFK or none. You know, it's not all about AFK. You made it. If you came to Canada, then be happier here. A lot of people are just happy to make it here. Right. Um, that's one thing. Now, the other thing is confidence. Right. Confidence. You need the right amount of confidence. OK, so this one people know overconfidence is not good. Overconfidence creates ignorance. What does that mean? Overconfidence will make you not read enough. So you read something once and you're like, oh, I'm good. I don't need to read it again. I already read that. That's overconfidence. But also lack of confidence this is something people think is a good thing. This causes unnecessary reading. People that read things over and over and over and over. They think they're doing a good thing. Oh my God, I read so much and I still failed. Well, because you're reading it over and over and over. Why are you reading the same thing so many times? Are you measuring what you're remembering and not? Are you try Are you actually being efficient? Are you eliminating the things that you already know so you don't repeat them and waste time on them and invest your time in something you don't know? That's Don't have that lack of confidence. And I'm going to show you how to measure this, okay? So how to manage confidence? You have to decide when to be confident and when to not be confident. Okay. The spark could get tricky. I'm just going to show you how to measure this. Okay. Sorry, I think we're going to go up to three guys. So maybe another half an hour. Um, I hope you guys could stick around because it's, it's, it is important. Okay. But here, if I read pathology today, okay, I read pathology. I read from, from pathology, I read maybe card 41, let's say. Okay, I read it today and I studied it. And then, and then I know I went through my other material and then in two months, it was another, it was time again to read pathology. Okay, so it was time again to read pathology. And I read, so this is two months time, right? Two months. So I'm now reading card 41 again. Okay. Imagine I read card 41 and I found out that I remember everything in card 41 because I created maybe questions on the front that kind of tested me. And I, and I thought, oh, look, I remember everything in it that's important that I need to remember. I know that, oh, this, this is like this and it looks like that. I kind of remember that. Okay. So now imagine the exam is, is uh, 1.5 months away, like maybe here, right? So 1.5 months. This is where the exam is. And up to here is like another two months, right? So based on this objective kind of evidence-based, you know, study on yourself, right? Since you remembered card 41 from two months ago, doesn't it only make sense that you'll remember it two months forward? I mean, it does, right? Like if you don't remember it two months forward, what really blocked your ability to remember it? Either you didn't get good sleep, maybe you were stressed, maybe fear. So the reason why you don't remember things is not you not having the knowledge. So most of the time it's other things. So here you have to have confidence that, look, I read this two months ago. I remember it today. So the months is, the exam is 1.5 months away. So I should remember this card 1.5 months away. So I don't need to read this. This is how, this is that's that simple, right? So that way you just eliminated what you need, what you don't read. Okay, now you read card 30. Let's say you've read card 42. Oh, and here you read card 42. Now you notice that you don't remember anything in card 42. Well, okay, that means two months. I I forgot card 42, so that means I should just to be careful read it again here, before the exam somewhere. Okay. So it's kind of like that. You have to have, so here I'm deciding to be confident. Confidence is not something like, you don't want to be overconfident because you're arrogant. You want to be, you want to decide. Here, it's, it's, isn't it justified to be confident that you're going to remember this card 
in, in this exam that's less than two months away. And actually, you should remember it for longer, right? Because, because this is your second time reading it. So you might read it, remember it for a longer time. And you might be better at recalling it. Okay, so this is what I, this is how you decide, how you study with confidence is that you measure things. You don't just like randomly com be confident. You be confident, but you measure. You go like, look, I remembered it, so I'm going to be confident. I'm going to decide to be confident and I'm and I'm not study it again because I, I should remember it in the exam. Is that clear, guys? Okay. The things you forget, have confidence that you'll remember a portion of them next time. Very important, don't assume you're going to remember everything. Expect to forget. This happens a lot with people because people get shocked when they learn how bad their memory is, okay? Our memories are not amazing after the first time. You will forget. Don't be alarmed. It's normal. If you read it once, I expect you to forget. You're not going to remember anything from maybe a little bit. But hopefully with the lectures, with reading, like with our technique, you, it'll be better. But just expect to forget from the first time. Now, while you're taking the exam, while you're inside the exam, always be confident. Play a confident person. Play a role. Assume inside the exam that you have the knowledge to solve all the questions. Because in the exam, there's no point of being not confident. Having doubt in your studying could help you kind of, you know, learn what you're not, what you need and, 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 and research and, and fear. And, and so you're learning new things. But in the exam, no doubts. Like kind of be really, make sure like that you're, the mentality you have, uh, this is what I tell my students, it might be funny, but it works. Imagine that the NDEB is asking you for advice and is trying to get your expertise, experienced expert opinion on the questions. If you feel that way, you're going to the exam, you study the AFK, you're, you are a master now in, in the sciences here, and they just want to know your opinion, man. So you just give them your opinion. You shouldn't be, be confident about, this is what my opinion is, this is what my opinion is, because it will make you relax in the exam. And during the, the course, we'll teach you all strat some strategies on how to answer questions, even if you don't know the exact answer. And the last one is expectation. Okay. Um, so expectation. Have high hopes. It's good to have high hopes, but also be prepared for realistic results. If you see a new question in the exam or a difficult question or something you never heard of, okay, that's going to happen. You're going to see difficult. So a lot of people also get stressed out because they have the wrong expectation. If you're walking into this exam thinking that you are going to get 100%, you're wrong. Okay. And even though I tell you you're wrong, what other people think is that, nope, I am going to be the one that's going to get 100%. So I'm going to work extra hard to do it. No, you're wrong. You're, you're just not. Just don't worry. You're not going to get it. So don't try to get 100%. That's what makes people stress out because they're missing out on the 100%. In, you have to get used to imperfection, okay? So have high hopes, but be prepared for realistic results. If you see a new, hard, difficult question in the exam, something you never heard of, this could break you and cause you to mess up other questions. So what we do is we'll practice that you, how to manage the situation. Well, how do you manage? Walk into the exam expecting to be confused about 50 questions. This is normal. This is the normal rate for people that get 90, by the way. So Hajar took the course once, and she was able to get 90, and she had 50 questions that she wasn't sure of. I got 91, and I got, and I also had 50 to 60 questions I wasn't sure of. This is normal. You're going to have questions. Are you going to let these 50 questions destroy you and mess up all your other questions and stress you out? No. These usually are just a distraction, guys. Okay, they want to see how can you manage stress and stress in the exam. If you see something you don't know, are you going to freak out or are you going to go like, well, I don't know this, I'm just going to move on. That's what you got to do. So just smile when you see one. Think, hey, everybody else feels the same way. I'm sure everybody feels the same way. If I'm finding it hard, everybody else is finding it hard. Why? Because you took a course and you did everything you can. So if everybody else kind of finds it difficult, I'm sure, sorry, if you find it difficult, I'm sure everybody else does. So just continue the exam. Remember, try to dig in your knowledge to solve these questions, okay? And at the end, manage yourself. We can help, but we can't force you to pass. You're the leader of yourself at the end, okay? And if you succeed, it's really you. It's not like Scholars Dental. We are helping you, but really it's your effort in studying and managing your obstacles and, and, and attending and studying. We're just, mess we're just delivering the message to you, really, okay? And we're here to be part of your success story, guys, okay? Um, 
And that's it pretty much for that AFK part. And what I'm going to talk to you about now is some of the history of the course and then how the course is organized. And then I'll show you the online. This is, hopefully won't take too long. And I'll, I'll go through this part quickly about the history. I just want to say, well, in my third year dental school, I realized that, you know, the university is not teaching us enough to be good dentists. So I started creating my own schedule. And my own schedule was, okay, I need to learn oral medicine because I have to recognize what's normal and what's not normal. So I, at least so I know what, when to refer people to pathology. But then I need to understand pain so I could learn when I do endo, where pain is coming from, because people visit the dentist for three reasons, right? Either pain, mainly, right? Function, and aesthetics. That's how I classify it, if you think. So pain is the main reason. And then function, I can't eat, maybe, right? They can't eat, something broke. Okay? And aesthetics, so people want to look better in certain ways. So I thought, okay, the main thing I need to understand is how to diagnose pain, because sometimes pain could be coming from the heart, actually, or from the GI tract. And sometimes people do endos that don't really need endos, right? So you have to understand inclusion and how it's related to pain. So I learned diagnosis and treatment of infections and painful situations. And then I thought, okay, once I learned this part, I need to learn how to restore. So I need to understand inclusion, how to restore single teeth, like restorations and crowns, and how to restore them, um, or how to rebuild missing teeth, basically, right? Like prosto, fixed prosto, removal of prosto. That's how I classify my own schedule. So my fourth year, I started reading. I start. I only read things from the university just to pass, really. But I started reading my own stuff, and I'm like, okay, I got to learn oral medicine. I loved it. It was pretty good. I read Burkitt's oral medicine, and that's where I get my understanding of it from. That's why I'm going to deliver that to you during the course. In my fifth year, I started learning endodontics, how to diagnose the pain. And I also went beyond and I went into books about pain physiology to really understand where pain of the pulps come from. And I teach you this in the course. I teach you how to think on histological level where the pain is coming from. Is it coming from C fiber or A delta fiber and why you do endo? Um, and then when I came to, I came back to Canada, I was already born, uh, I was already here before I had a citizenship and I came back and in 2011 and 12, I, I, I wasn't accepted to the NDEB yet, so I had to delay it to 2013. And I spent a year really reading more books. So I'm like, okay, now I got to learn perio and also occlusion. So I started reading from these books. And what I did is I kept one day a week that I read from textbooks on Saturdays to keep myself interested because it was fun for me. And on the other days, I read the Dental Dex Part 2. I did 10 cards a day, one card from each subject. And then I realized our knowledge in basic science is pretty weak. And we're the only course that gives you the pro a proper basic science, okay? Unless other courses, I don't know, found our book and started using it. I'm not sure. But we, I'm, I've developed this basic science myself from scratch. So I knew I needed to strengthen this. And what I did is I thought, okay, what's, what basic science do we need to know to learn as a dentist? And I thought physiology, cells and tissues that we find in the mouth, like bone, epithelium, connective, the main things we deal with, right? And then dental as well, like teeth tissue, basically. And I focused on looking at cells of the body, epithelium, connects bone. I had confidence that these topics will help me in pathology mainly and pharmacology. So I used all these references, and, and actually I used more, but these are the ones I, I kind of fit here on this thing. Um, physiology books, right? Basic histology books like Jankaira's basic histology, oral histology books like 10 Kates, basic pathology, and anatomy videos like Ackland's really amazing anatomy videos. And I combined all this, and then when I did the questions, the release questions, I figured out, okay, what we really need is this, and I kept playing with it until I got, like, a good combination, okay? Um, pharmacology, I learned from the USMLE Kaplan videos, which are videos made for um, medical students in the U.S., and it was pretty good, but it's pretty extensive for dentists, and I summarized that as well for you guys. Pathology, I took from the dental decks, but reorganized. And also, I use my understanding from Burkitt's oral medicine to make it make sense, plus um, other books that need that we needed details from to answer certain questions. And pathology is really all about repetition. Okay, occlusion I told you from Dawson and also Contemporary Fix, and also some from I got some from Arts and Science, dental materials from the books that we need. And thankfully, 2013 I took the exam and I got 91. And one day I hope you'll all feel that same feeling. Okay, 
soon, hopefully. And I started teaching. I created these specific topics and I found, and they were pretty good. Like I worked really hard on creating these and I still use them till today with some adjustments and, and, and um, updates. And people, I found people really benefiting from them with good feedback. So I felt that, hey, this is something I could keep doing. At that point, I was working with, um, I was teaching with other companies and I got my license and started working in 2014. So my, my AFK was 2013, Feb, and I started working in 2000, February, uh, 2014. And then I started making my pathology lecture. And when I started working, I realized there's a huge difference between the academic knowledge and, exper and experience in real, uh, real life work. So I decided to take some time off and focus on experience. And I've been working since then. And actually, I went and tried to get even more knowledge about real life stuff. So I took oral surgery courses, wisdom teeth removal courses, implant courses. That's why I'm saying here, you don't really need to be a specialist. You could learn all these things. Occlusion courses, Invisalign, IV sedation, so I could do IV sedation, nitrous oxide and oral sedation. Medical emergencies, I learned how to read and use CBCTs. Um, and I've been practicing up till now. And I, I, I thought, you know what, I want to go back to education. So I, cr I finished up all the other topics that I did not have and make, and I made those. And I prepared my first course in 2017. Um, as my friend was coming to actually do it, and I said, you know what, I'll do one. And I realized I still lo I, how much I love this thing, and I converted all my lectures into books. So if you notice, um, other courses may have this huge pile of books, right? Like, this huge pile of books, this is the back of the book, really, like a, but a large pile, and our books look like this, right? And why is that? Some people ask me, how come other courses may have more books? It's not that they have more books. What it is is that they print out slides, so their page looks like this, right? So it's like a slide here, and then a slide here. And then what happens is that it takes more space. With my book, I created it in a doc format, so it actually is just like this, right? And what this does is save space. So all the info you need, I've combined it and condensed it in four books. And these people are just, like other people are just printing out slides, which is kind of I worked really hard on making it in a booklet style, right? And this is the books that I'll be giving you that has all the info you need. So when you guys register, whether it's in class or online, if it's, you'll get these books, basically. If it's in class um, and you pay in full, you get them right away. If it's in class installments, you'll get them uh, in doses. Online, there's no installments. You have to pay in full because we want to ship them all at once instead of shipping them multiple times. Because if we do that, it'll be really expensive for you. Why do that? because we don't give all the books unless you pay in full. If you want to do, that's the best way to do it. So here, um, once you, you register, basically you will, and this is a point I need to make here about the online course. Please, if you decide to register, you want to do it as soon as you can, because it's gonna take time to print them and then ship them to whatever country you're in um, or wherever you are. Like if our course is starting March 9, let's say 16, like best for online, you want to have the books before that date so that you could um, watch the videos and have the books, right? Look, if you register late, if you decide you want to register, you know, March 9, right? And we we have we couldn't get you the books on time. Honestly, that's not our fault. That's your fault. You, you were late in registration. You only have the video up for one week. So if it goes away, you won't be able to watch the video and go through the book um, simultaneously. And we want you to do that. But for you to do that, you have to register soon. So that's why I recommend registering, like we basically have a month until that course. So it could take two weeks to get to you. It could take two weeks to print the books. So especially if we have a big order, like 30 people, um, we're gonna have to print 30 books for each uh, and we have to go get them and then ship them to the right addresses. That all takes time, guys. So it's not gonna happen suddenly, right? So please take that into consideration. If you register late and do not get the books, please do not ask to watch, to upload the videos again because we can't. Each week, you have a week for the video, we bring it down, we put a new video, right? So please take this in consideration, register ASAP so that we could get the books to you on time, okay? Um, so our plan is to do this, go through the basic science, that's our first two days, because I believe that's the main thing in the beginning, and once you learn that very well, it's going to be so helpful for pharmacology and pathology, and you'll see, okay? And I believe that you're a scientist before you're being before you become a doctor. You're a scientist, right? Um, so someone's asking, within a week, can you watch videos multiple times? I don't even know if you'll have time to do it, but you can. Yeah, 
Um, but I just don't know if you'll have time. They're long videos. I'm going to show you the demonstration to see how much work that's put into it. And you're going to have a lot of stuff to do, right? But I'm going to show you that soon. We're very close to it. And then our plan after the basic science is to go into the medicine stuff. This is how I organize the schedule. The schedule is organized, crafted to make it best for you. Okay, a lot of courses make the schedule based on their time. Like, oh, we don't have time to teach it here. This instructor doesn't have time. So the, I make the schedule and then I make this, I ask the instructors to fit their time with the schedule because this is what's best for you. First, you start with basic science, then the medicine stuff. You get into pharma, pathology, and anesthesia. Why? Because right after the basic science, that's the best thing to go into is pharma. And you want to get pathology and pharmacology early in the course so that you have more time to repeat it because they require repetition. They're the hardest things. My course, this is how it works. It starts off difficult and it gets easier. Okay. But you want the difficult things in the beginning so that you have more time to repeat them. And obviously the basic science are important for them. And from this, you will become the doctor learning about diseases, how to understand pathological oral medicine terminology and, and pharmacology as well. Okay, and here you are, you're becoming, you know what, you're a doctor before you're a dentist. So don't let anyone tell you that a doctor is like a higher rank than a dentist. That's not true. Okay, you are a doctor before you become a dentist. You have to understand that you're actually the specialist. You are the specialist in the oral cavity, right? Are you not? Right? You're the specialist in the face here. Who else deals with that area? No one else deals with that area. Yeah, the ENT does the ears and the, um, you know, the sinuses and the nose. But you're specializing in the jaws and mouth, right? That's your specialty as a doctor. No other doctor does that. You're not, it's not that doctor and the dentist is like something below that. You know what I mean? Some people look at it, especially back home, they look at it like this. You're actually, you are a doctor and you're a, you're, you're a specialist in one of the hardest. It's, it's so complicated that they need to separate it from being a doctor, from, from its own, from medicine, right? Like that's how complicated it is. Being a dentist is so complicated and special in a very highly specialist area that it needed its own facility, it needed its own, um, you know, its own whole thing. That's how complicated it is. We're like, guy, take, we, there's no time to be a doctor, then, you know, study medicine, then study dentistry. We need to start with dentistry right away. And, you know, you give the most complicated anesthesias, the, you work with the complicated joints to very um, respect it. It's, it's, it's something, you are a physician. This is, this is the way Dawson says it, a physician of the mastication system. That's who you are. You're a physician. You're not just someone drilling teeth. You are most of the time, but you're really a physician of the mastication system, a physician of the oral, uh, an oral physician, basically, right? And then what's our plan after that is to do the engineering stuff. And this is where you become the dentist, right? Dental materials, prosthodontics, restorative ortho. This is where you learn all the, this is where you become the dentist. And then after that, we'll go into the surgical stuff where you learn endo, perio, implants, surgery, radiology, and then here you could say you're the doctor of dental surgery, and that's what that name means, right? So I hope that clarifies the pathway of the course. Um, a question, at the end of the monks, do we get answers with explanations? Yes, on the online monks, we have added explanations, guys, so I don't think anyone else has that as well. Um, so let me show you here a comparison just to see what we improved from last year, okay? And I want to give you some facts. So, and I'm going to tell you what other courses also do. And so basically, usually a course, what does a course have? It has lectures. Okay, so, you know, some other courses have lectures. Some courses only do questions. I don't think that's a good idea. You want both, lectures and questions. So find, find, make sure you're going to a course that has both. We have both, obviously. So questions and lectures. Um, Facebook support, almost all courses provide some sort of Facebook support, and we do that too, to keep communication, to answer questions and stuff like that. Final mock exams, almost all courses have a mock exam at the end. Honestly, some mock exams for some courses are not good, they're just released. So be careful with that. I make sure that they're very high quality mock exams that you will benefit from for within your exam, okay? And I highly recommend if you're doing the online course, to try to come and do the mocks in person. We will we will just let us know and we'll provide space for you, okay? And we could arrange that. Now, the online mock, I think we are, I don't see any other courses doing a proper online mock. We are the ones that are doing online mocks and we provide this also free to all our in-class students that you for, for the online mocks. 
Okay, um, and you'll get explanations. No one else does an online mock with explanations like that. I don't think they even do online mocks. Um, some courses do online, but they're just to release questions. And you don't want that. You want something that's really good and that could help you with the exam. Um, I'm not sure what I don't know of courses that do alumni discounts. Maybe they do, but I didn't see anything like um, clear. We actually do a clear formal alumni discount and a lot of people took advantage of this. So if you're paying now, let's say, for 4,000 and something for the for the course. If you want to take it again, you'll actually pay. So if you're paying now, let's say 40, 4,600 for online with tax, right? With plus tax. So um, it, it has a tax in it already. So it's like 39 plus um, HST plus 200 shipping for the material. This is for online. If you want to take the course again, it will be 2,500. This includes the tax. So you're really paying 22 something plus HST. And that's a really good difference if you want to take the course again and still have access to the videos or just do the course again, right? Um, so that's for the alumni disc discounts. So we provide that and we still provide that till 2019. Everything pretty much will still provide. Now what's new? Okay, online videos. No one, no other course has the videos that we kind of have now. And I'm going to show you a demonstration of that. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to show you how that looks. And I think you guys will, will like it a lot. So online videos, you're going to be able to rewind, repeat them. You're going to have flexible times. All the other courses that do online, they're mostly just um, live or you have to go attend somewhere and be, be somewhere, leave your home and be somewhere on time. So it's kind of like a live broadcasted thing. Um, and usually I, my experience with that was not good because it's very hard to to kind of organize a bunch of students in class with students that are coming from other areas or, or attending from other locations and trying to manage all the questions. There's no point. This is a lot more better for you with flexibility and repeatability. Okay, and that's something new we've added to the course from 2018 to 19. We also added an online forum on our website. So if any question you have, you in this forum, you could search for questions um, that have been already answered. You could post a question, put comments, and this is a lot better than Facebook. And I'm gonna show you how that looks like. Um, we switched from Facebook to, to having in our own forum, which is really awesome because you could organize it based on subject, not like Facebook where you have to kind of like search for, it's just all over the place, right? And I added something that I actually wasn't even sure I'll be able to get done by this course, but I, I was able to do it. And this is online quiz. And what this is, is you're gonna have a quiz before the session and a quiz after the session. And and uh, you could test yourself. So the quiz before the session will stimulate curiosity. And then the quiz after the session will kind of show you how much you improved. And that's something also we added. So I wanted to show you that even with our 2018 stuff, our passing rate was around 80%. We're still waiting on, on results for the last one. For, from previous people, it was 80%. I think other courses said there were 50 to 60. Maybe they improved a bit. But imagine after all this new stuff we've added, what the passing rate is going to be. I think it's going to be higher than 80%. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty confident in that. Um, and we also send bags. So, yes, we are. We do have cool bags that we're going to send everybody. Um, and now I'm going to demonstrate. This is very important, this part, to demonstrate how the online works. Um, I'm going to show you how does the online course work, how does the in-class course work, and the membership page and registration and all that stuff, okay? And I'm not going to talk about classroom etiquette. If you're a classroom, if you're coming to the class, just come to the March 9th one, and I'll demonstrate this and then say goodbye to you guys. So let's demonstrate, okay? Let's do the demonstration. Okay, so I'm going to have to switch to the website here. Does everybody see the website now? Hazar, can you confirm if you see that? Just to make sure that everything's working properly. Okay, so you can see the website. So basically, it's pretty straightforward. I'm gonna kind of um, navigate through the website as a student. I'm gonna show you what students get, okay? All right, guys, so this is the cool part, I hope, for you. Um, let me see if I can make it maximize here. Oh, here I know what I'm doing. I have to escape from this. Okay, there. And then this way I could. Okay, that's it. 
All right, so, so basically you want to go to scholarsdental.com, right? So here's scholarsdental.com. Oops, sorry. And, and now you're at Scholars Dental. So I'm just going to give you some navigation about the website, and I'm going to show you the members page, what you'll get when you're a student. So for, um, here's the courses. Basically, if you want to learn, there's a lot of orientation stuff inside this page. You see why I'm marking here the AFK course? If you go there, you'll see previous orientation sessions there. Um, ACJ course is there. About, if you want to learn about the NDEB process, it's here. Some more stuff. And here's the AFK schedule. So now if you go for the AFK, just click here, and you'll see our schedule. You see? You guys are still with me? This is the schedule, so sweet. Now you have an easy way to get to the schedule. Every time you feel like you need to check the schedule, all you have to do is go to About and then AFK Schedule. And you can see here, uh, March 16th, March 9th is the open house. March 16th is basic science. So that's when we'll start posting the online um, stuff is, is with the basic science. You'll be, wa you'll be with the, um, you'll be kind of smoothly walking with the in class from there. And you can see when we have off and, <coughs> And everything okay and then the mocks are in the last tier and you could download this as a PDF so whenever you have questions about the schedule it is right there okay so that's pretty much there what you need and if you want to register I'm just going to give you like a simple way to do it sorry that's not the place I wanted to go to if you wanted to register um, you could just you can see these buttons here the registration so if you want to register for the AFK course you could go here and you could register and I'll show you that later now let's do the cool stuff, okay? Let's see what you get as a student. So you as a student could go to the members page and you'll have to make an account. So I'll ask you to make an account. You make an account, try to use Gmail if you can. And then everybody in the world could get to this page, right? Everybody in the world could get to this page. You don't have to be a student to get to this specific page. But you need to be a student to get to all these. You see these ones here? Okay, so this is all free stuff for everybody. Pharmacology review um, on YouTube, the pharma quiz, AFK mock sample. An orientation. If you want to watch last year's orientation? I recommend you do because it could be different. So you can see here on YouTube, you're watching last year's orientation. Okay. Okay, so it's kind of like similar. So now to the course, but, but I. You know, here's where you'll go with the epidemiology. I'm going to show you. We're going to give you the password for this page so you could watch the epidemiology. Okay. And, and here, if you want to see samples of the online course. Okay. Now, what are you going to do as a student? Here's what you're going to do. First, before the session, you want to, you want to do your quiz. So you go to the quiz. Look at this. So this is what we provided. And I think I'm pretty proud of this stuff because it's pretty cool that we got it done. So first, here you have quizzes. So you have quizzes for every weekend. You see? And what you want to do is you want to go to the pre-lecture quiz. So there's pre-lecture and there's also a post-lecture quiz. So you go to the pre-lecture quiz. Okay, so you see here it says pre-lecture quiz. And you say here it's a basic science weekend, so you click on it. All right, now you got the quiz. So that's your pre-lecture quiz. You put your email here. Okay, uh, I can put my email, whatever. And then you start solving this quiz. 50 questions and then you submit at the end, okay? Once you submit, um, you'll see, so you can submit it at the end, right? So here's the thing, um, you'll get your mark. So this is the Friday quiz, I call it, because the one before the session, the weekend. You'll get your mark, but you won't get the correct answers. And then you go and you take, I'll tell you why you don't get correct answers, because I don't want to spoil it for you yet. I want you to learn, I want you to evaluate yourself without knowing what the correct answers are. Okay, and I'll tell you, the post lecture quiz, you'll do this after the session. So now, once you go do the session, you do the post lecture quiz. Okay, so now you see post lecture quiz, and then you go basic science again. Okay, that's fine for now. So this is the post Monday quiz. This is the one after your weekend. You do this one, and, and it'll show you this one. When you do it, you'll get the answers and the correct answers in your mark as well. And you could measure how much you improved from the first one. Okay. Now, once you, I'm just telling you about the quiz. So one is pre before the session, and one is after the session. So when you do the pre lecture quiz for basic science, now let's say let's say we did pharmacology. Okay. So pre lecture quiz, and you did pharmacology one. So you did this quiz. Okay. Now you got your mark. 
Now the weekend came and you should go to videos. All right, so now you're going to see the videos. Okay, so module two and three pharmacology. Here are your videos. Okay, so it says here day one, this is what we're teaching. Day two, this is what we're teaching. This is the, the weekend after, so this won't, may not be active yet. So you go, okay, well, I need to learn day one, principles cholinergic and adrenergic. You click on it. Great. Now what? You open the video and you just play it. Play. Here is the whole thing for day one. You could forward, you could pause, you could rewind. Um, you can't maximize, but if you want to make it smaller, you could hold control and then it's like zoom out and zoom in. See, like this. You need to do that, I think. I think it's a, it's a fine size. Um, play it. Okay, you'll see all the land. I think it's pretty good quality. You can see the slides and the board, right? Now, you finish watching the day one, and there's an instruction underneath. So it says, solve questions from 1 to 99. Is that clear? So what you do is you solve the questions from one. I want you to feel like you're in class. So now you finish day one, you solve these questions from one to 99. Uh, is that clear? No, these videos could be only uploaded for one week. The, the goal is so that you're getting an in-class experience. Can people in class watch the in-class lecture more than once over a few weeks? You can't, right? So this is like, we're trying to solve the distance problem is that you come to the course so we're giving you the ability to come to the course but we shouldn't you shouldn't be able to watch it forever right it doesn't make sense you can't even upload that money videos at once the whole point is to get you to feel that you're coming to class of course you don't have access to download the slides that would be honestly ridiculous for any institute but anyway um, um the slides here you have the book and you have also um this, you can see the whole lecture here. We don't provide slides for students. We give you the book. The book has everything you need. Okay, you don't need the slides themselves. Okay. Um, so, and then you finish this video. You can watch the second video. So, let's say you solve the questions from 1 to 99 that we'll be providing you. Once you solve those questions, you go to the forum. You see? Please pay attention because you have to know how to do this by yourself, right? So, now you go to a forum. We have an ACJ and AFK forum. And you go to the AFK place, and you can go to answer keys. So when you go to answer keys, you could see, okay, well, what are you solving? Well, you were solving pharma. We don't have the uploaded yet, but let's say you have the basic science answer keys, and you can see here that you have all the answers. So you solve from one to ninety-nine, let's say in pharma, then you you go to one to ninety-nine in pharma. Okay, you, you solve, and you see the answers, and if you have any question about like, you know, there's some question that you didn't get. What you could do is, okay, go to the pharmacology area, let's say. See, pharmacology. And you could say, I already posted something for you guys, see. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the orientation. But you could go to the pharmacology and create a new post. And you could write your question. So type in your question like, oh, you know, whatever the question is, the antidote. for um, atropin, I don't know, overdose. You know, you're typing your question, and then once you post it, people could comment, and one of the instructors will answer you and explain the answer. Also search for questions. So if you have a question here, antidote, and then you can search for the question, and then you, you could find it answered already. So try to search before you type one in. Okay, so the, now you got your answers, and then you could go back to the videos. And then you can say two when you want to. You don't have to do it one day because it takes time to do all of this. And then you, that's me again with my iconic, um, you know, messy hair. That's fine. Um, what you care is about the knowledge, right? And you do day two. So we were talking about cardiovascular and all that stuff. And then, you, again, you do the instructions. It says questions from 100 to 178. And then you do those questions, you go back to the forum, you check it, and then you finish the weekend. Once you finish the weekend, you go back to the quiz area, remember, and then you do the the quiz, the post-lecture quiz, and that's pharmacology one. And then you test yourself on it and you see how well you did.
Great. That's it, guys. I hope you, I think, um, like, you know, we, we're providing something really awesome here. No, no other lectures will provide something that you could rewind and, and, rec and something recorded like this, you know, but we also have to also protect ourselves because we don't want these to be kind of, you know, recorded and stuff like that. So you will have your name in the middle here, as you can see my name a little bit. And that's, you know, like we don't agree that you could kind of record these. Um, you should watch them. Just we, we want to help you pass. We don't want you to, you know, it's not fair that anyone records and starts giving it to other people. This is you. This is your effort. You, you, you want to pay for this course and, and made the effort to come. So you deserve to watch it. And that's it, right? Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, let me see what else did I miss. Um, the mocks will open for a mock exam. So here's the mock section. And then you could do mock one, mock two, mock three. And but they're right now we're not accepting responses. They'll open up later. And then you have the alumni. So it's just better to contact us if you want to do the course again, because we'll we'll tell you about the discounts. But there's the alumni area. And that's pretty much it. And then you I mean I think it's pretty awesome that we have all this stuff and and each weekend we'll remove these videos and put new videos for you to watch. Okay. Okay, now the answer keys, um, we're going to try to provide explanations for all the questions that we predict need explanation. And if you have any question, just post it in the forum. That's the whole point of the forum. And then we'll, we'll answer it for you and we'll explain it. I mean, we're trying to do the best we can to provide you the best experience regarding the distance, you know, and, and all that. So now if you want to register, you could just go like, you know, if you go here, I'm going to show you. We, this is very important the way you register because we need to know your address to send you, send the books to the right place, right? So if you go to AFK, right? So this is the registration page. Um, so you have to, please don't make any mistakes here. Make sure you're registering for the right course. If you want online and you register for this one, we're not going to accept it. Like we're not, you know, we're not, we're, we know what we're doing. We're, we're paying attention to everything. So please do the right one. Save us time. Save yourself time. If you want the online, we have to charge the shipping and handling because it takes us a lot of time to actually get that done for everybody. Um, so, so it's register for the online. If you want to do the online and then you'll be asked to enter your information. So like, um, if that is, um, I don't know, whatever. I'm going to put a random email. Okay. You put your address, whatever address it is, right? So put an accurate address, the shipping address you want to ship, put your phone number. I'm just going to kind of like put whatever right now. And then you go to step two. And then you agree to the conditions, that, you know, the copyright conditions. Okay. So I accept those terms and then you go. And then here we just want to make sure you confirm what your course is. So do you want the March AFK or March online? AFK or ACJ. So you just confirm here and then it's going to be 4100 plus tax and you know, you'll, you'll register. And then once we get your address and info, we'll confirm it and then print your books and then ship it to you. And that's it. And you, you're, you're welcome to learn the online course. So what are some questions here? Yeah. So thank you. Hajar is answering the questions and I think I made the demonstration pretty clear. Is there any questions about the like the members area, the how it works, the online? Let me know if, if anyone um, has any questions about that. Okay, guys. So we did this part. Classroom etiquette. I don't think this applies to you if you're doing online. Um, but anyway, you know, just normal things like don't blurt out answers. Don't yell out answers when we're a answering questions. Raise your hand when you ask something, you know, all that stuff. But for your online people, it doesn't really matter. And right after this, we will send you the link to the epidemiology and the password for that page. I highly recommend you watch the epidemiology lecture. It's part of your course if you're taking the course. Plus, watch the previous orientations. Okay, so watch the epidemiology. And watch 
previous orientations. I might have said things differently last year, so it's also beneficial. Okay, and that's pretty much it, guys. I want to say thank you um, for attending. I know we went over time, but I mean, that's a good thing too, right? I'm giving you more time. That's fine. I, I want you guys to get the best I could give, like, and I want, I want to finish it. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Now I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have about anything we talked about. And Dr. Hager is also helping out answering the questions. Um, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I hope it was helpful. Um, anyone that is interested in registering, contact info at scholarsdental.com. I think you guys already know the email. If you if you don't know how to do it, like I hope I showed it to you and it's um you're welcome. Thank you guys. The I mean look, if you register late, you'll receive the material late. That's just it. You could register you could register on the same day of the basic science, but you the only the only bad thing is that you won't have the book when when you you're watching the video, and I don't think that's a, it's better to have the book. You're welcome, Doctor Sarah. Thank you. And um, any questions about anything? I'm gonna stay for a bit until I feel everybody's done. Um, can you go into specialty? You could try to apply, but it's a it's a really um, low chance for universities to accept you if you're not from a graduate from the university. You know, because let's say like connections do help. You're welcome, guys. Yeah, the results will come up. So what you could do is, um, if you're sure you're going to take the course, if you're sure you're going to take the course, you could register for it. And then if you pass, we could, oh, that would be difficult because we have to ship you the stuff. Yeah, well, you have to be sure you want to take the course. So it's 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 up to you how to figure that out. No, no books and email. Um, the books are only mailed to you, shipped to you physically. And they have your names on every page. And there we, 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 we don't, it's not allowed to copy them for other people or anything. So you have your names on the books in every page in case. Okay. So we want to help you, but also we have to protect ourselves. Yes, so an AFK exam usually it's one one quite um one answer now. Okay guys, thank you. I'm just gonna stop the recording part.